Book Auctioneers The second class of patterers includes jugglers, showmen, clowns, and fortune tellers, besides several exhibitors who invite public notice to the wonders of the telescope or microscope. The third and last class of patterers are those who neither sell nor amuse, but only victimize those who get into their clutches. These, to use their own words, do it on the bounce. Their general resort is an inferior public house, sometimes a brothel, or a coffee shop. One of the tricks of these worthies is to group together at a window, and if a well-dressed person pass by, to salute him with the contents of a flower bag. One of their pals, better dressed than the rest, immediately walks out, declares it was purely accidental, and invites the gentleman in to be brushed. Probably he consents, and still more probably, if he be good-natured, he is plied with liquor, drugged with snuff for the occasion, and left in some obscure court, utterly stupefied. When he awakes, he finds that his watch, purse, and k are gone. A casual observer, or even a stranger, may be induced to contract a wayside acquaintance with the parties to whom I allude, says one of the pattern class, from whom I have received much valuable information. And if he be a visitor of fairs and races, that acquaintance, though slight, may sometimes prove expensive. But casual observers cannot, from the complexity and varied circumstances of the characters now under notice, form anything like a correct view of them. I am convinced that no one can, but those who have visited their haunts and indeed lived among them for months together. They are not to be known, any more than the great city was to be built, in a day. This advantage, if so it may be called, has fallen to my lot. The three classes of patterers above enumerated must not be confounded. The two first are essentially distinct from the last, at least they do something for their living. And though the pattering street tradesmen may generally overstep the bounds of truth in their glowing descriptions of the virtues of the goods they sell, still it should be remembered they are no more dishonest in their dealings than the enterprising class of shopkeepers, who resort to the printed mode of puffing off their wares. Indeed the street sellers are far less reprehensible than their more wealthy brother puffers of the shops, who cannot plead want as an excuse for their dishonesty. The recent revelations made by the Lancet, as to the adulteration of the articles of diet sold by the London grocers, show that the patterers who sell, practice far less imposition than some of our merchant princes. A tradesman in Tottenham Court Road, whose address the Lancet advertises gratis, thus proclaims the superior qualities of his finest white pepper. One package of this article, which is the interior part of the kernel of the finest pepper, being equal in strength to nearly three times the quantity of black pepper, which is the inferior, small, shriveled berries. And often little more than husks, it will be not only the best but the cheapest for every purpose. This super-excellent pepper, sold in packages, price 1d, was found on analysis to consist of finely ground black pepper, and a very large quantity of wheat flour. Indeed the Lancet has demonstrated that as regards tea, coffee, arrowroot, sugar, and pepper sold by pattering shopkeepers, the rule invariably is that those are articles which are the most puffed, and warranted free from adulteration. And, to which the attention of families and invalids is particularly directed as being of the finest quality ever imported into this country, are uniformly the most scandalously adulterated of all. We should, therefore, remember while venting our indignation against pattering street sellers, that they are not the only puffers in the world, and that they, at least, can plead poverty in extenuation of their offense. Whereas, it must be confessed, that shopkeepers can have no other cause for their acts but their own brutalizing greed of gain. The class of patterers with whom we have here to deal are those who patter to help off their goods, but while describing them it has been deemed advisable to say a few words, also, on the class who do nothing but patter. As a means of exciting commiseration to their assumed calamities. These parties, it should be distinctly understood, are in no way connected with the puffing street sellers, but in the exaggerated character of the orations they deliver. They are mostly professional beggars, or bouncers, that is to say cheats of the lowest kind, and will not work or do anything for their living. This, at least, cannot be urged against the pattering street sellers who, as was before stated, do something for the bread they eat. Further to show the extent, and system, 
of the lodging and routes throughout the country of the class of lurkers, and here described, as all resorting to those places, I got a patterer to write me out a list, from his own knowledge, of divers' routes, and the extent of accommodation in the lodging houses. I give it according to the patterer's own classification. Brighton is a town where there is a great many furnished cribs, let to needies, nightly lodgers, that are mauled up, that is to say, associated with women in the sleeping rooms. Surrey and Sussex. Dossing cribs. Or lodging houses beds. Needies, or. Nightly lodgers. Wandsworth 69108. Croydon 98144. Rygate 5660. Cookfield 2832. Horsham 3752. Lewis 7684. Kingston 128192. Brighton 169228. Bristol. Dot, a few years back, an old woman kept a padding ken here. She was a strong Methodist, but had a queer method. There was thirty standing beds, besides makeshifts and furnished rooms, which were called cottages. It's not so bad now. The place was well known to the monkry, and you was reckoned flat if you hadn't been there. The old woman, when any female, old or young, who had no tin, came into the kitchen, made up a match for her with some men. Fellows half drunk had the old women. There was always a broomstick at hand, and they was both made to jump over it and that was called a broomstick wedding. Without that ceremony a couple weren't looked on as man and wife. In course the man paid, in such case, for the dose, bed. Kensington 6784. Brentford 128192. Hounslow 6560. Colebrook 2720. Windsor 710140. Maidenhead 4540. Reading 129216. Oxford 147196. Banbury 1012240. Marlborough 87112. Bath 108160. Bristol 2011440. Counties of Kent and Essex. Here is the best places in England for skipper birds, parties that never go to lodging houses but to barns or outhouses, sometimes without a blanket. The Kent farmers permit it to their own travellers, or the travellers they know. In Essex it's different. There a farmer will give ones. Rather than let a traveller sleep on his premises, for fear of robbery. Keyhole whistlers, the skipper birds are sometimes called, but they're regular travellers. Kent's the first county in England for them. They start early to good houses for vittles, when gentlefolk are not up. I've seen them doze and sleep against the door. They like to be there before anyone cuts their cart, exposes their tricks. Travelers are all early risers. It's good morning in the country when it's good night in town. Kent. Dossing cribs. Or lodging houses beds, needies, or. Nightly lodgers. Deptford 18 9324. Greenwich 6 826. Woolwich 9 8144. Gravesend 6 784. Chatham 2010400. Maidstone 5 770. Sittingbourne 3 636. Sheerness 4 540. Faversham 3 530. Canterbury 11 8176. Dover 12 9216. Ramsgate 4 540. Margate 6 672. Essex. Stratford 10 9180. Ilford 3 752. Barking 4 648. Billericay 5 770. Orsett 2 832. Rayleigh 3954. Rockford 3848. Lee 4864. Prettywell 2728. Southend 3848. Malden 5990. Witham 4864. 
Colchester 1510300. Windsor. At Ascot race time I've paid many ones. Just to sit up all night. Colchester. Life in London at the Bugle, called Hell Upon Earth sometimes. Barnet 5180. Watford 6890. Hemel Hempstead 3530. Uxbridge 6784. Train 2624. Dunstable 6560. Stony Stratford 3636. Northampton 139234. Toaster 4756. Daventry 5990. Coventry 169288. Birmingham 5011100. Hearts and Bedfordshire. Edmonton 147196. Waltham Abbey 3636. Chesant Street 2728. Hodston 3848. Hertford 99162. Ware 710140. Puckridge 2520. Buntingford 3848. Royston 41040. Hitchin 79126. Luton 6896. Bedford 97126. St. Albans 8696. Suffolk and Norfolk. Ipswich 24 8384. Hadley 8 7112. Halstead 5660. Stowmarket 4756. Woodbridge 6560. Sudbury 4756. Berries T. Edmonds 8 8128. Thetford 3 636. Attleboro 2 520. Wyndham 111 22. Norwich 49720. Yarmouth 16 8256. Of the Screevers, or Writers of. Begging Letters and Petitions. Screeving, that is to say, writing false or exaggerated accounts of afflictions and privations, is a necessary corollary to pattering. Or making pompous orations in public, and I here subjoin a brief description of the business, for although the screevers, economically, considered, belong properly to the class who will not work. Yet as they are intimately connected with the street trade of begging I have thought it best to say a few words on the subject here. Reserving a more comprehensive and scientific view of the subject till such time as I come to treat of the professional beggar, under the head of those who are able but unwilling to labor for their livelihood. In contradistinction to the involuntary beggars, who belong more properly to those who are willing but unable to work. The subjoined information has been obtained from one who has had many opportunities of making himself acquainted with the habits and tricks of the class here treated of, indeed, at one part of his life he himself belonged to the profession. In England and Wales the number of vagrants committed to prison annually amounts to 19,621. And as many are not imprisoned more than a dozen times during their lives, and a few never at all, the number of tramps and beggars may be estimated, at the very lowest, at 22,000 throughout England and Wales. The returns from Scotland are indeterminate. Of this wretched class many are aged and infirm, others are destitute orphans, while not a few are persons whose distress is real, and who suffer from temporary causes. With this excusable class, however, I have not now to do. Of professional beggars there are two kinds, those who do it on the blob, by word of mouth, and those who do it by screeving, that is, by petitions and letters, setting forth imaginary cases of distress. Of these documents there are two sorts, slums, letters, and fakements, petitions. These are seldom written by the persons who present or send them, but are the production of a class of whom the public little imagine either the number or turpitude. I mean the professional begging letter writers. Persons who write begging letters for others sometimes, though seldom, beg themselves. They are in many cases well supported by the fraternity for whom they write. A professional of this kind is called by the cadgers, their man of business. Their histories vary as much as their abilities, generally speaking they have been clerks, 
teachers, shopmen, reduced gentlemen, or the illegitimate sons of members of the aristocracy. While others, after having received a liberal education, have broken away from parental control, and commenced the profession in early life, and will probably pursue it to their graves. I shall take a cursory view of the various pretenses set forth in these begging documents, says my informant, and describe some of the scenes connected with their preparation. The documents themselves are mournful catalogues of all the ills that flesh is heir to. I address myself first to that class of petitions which represent losses by sea, or perhaps shipwreck itself. These documents are very seldom carried by one person, unless indeed he is really an old sailor, and, to the credit of the navy be it spoken, this is very seldom the case. When the imposition under notice has to be carried out, it is, for the most part, conducted by half a dozen worthless men, dressed in the garb of seamen, and known as turnpike sailors. One of their number having really been at sea and therefore able to reply to any nautical inquiries which suspicion may throw out. This person mostly carries the document, and is, of course, the spokesman of the company. Generally speaking, the gang have a subscription book, sometimes only a fly leaf or two to the document, to receive the names of contributors. It may not be out of place here, to give a specimen, drawn from memory, of one of those specious but deceitful fakements upon which the swells, especially those who have been in the service. Come down with a cooter, sovereign, if they, granny the molly, perceive the signature, of a brother officer or friend. The document is generally as follows. These are to certify, to all whom it may concern, that the thunderer, Captain Johnson, was returning on her homeward-bound passage from China, laden with tea, fruit, and and having beside, twenty passengers, chiefly ladies, and a crew of thirty hands, exclusive of the captain and other officers. That the said vessel encountered a tremendous gale off the banks of Newfoundland, and was dismasted, and finally wrecked at midnight on, such a day, including the hour, latitude, and other particulars. That the above-named vessel speedily foundered, and only the second mate and four of the crew, the bearers of this certificate, escaped a watery grave. These, after floating several days on broken pieces of the ship, were providentially discovered, and humanely picked up by the brig Invincible, Captain Smith, and landed in this town and harbour of Portsmouth, in the county of Hants. That we, the Master of Customs, and two of Her Majesty's Justices of the Peace for the said harbour and county, do hereby grant and afford to the said, here follows the names of the unfortunate mariners, this our vouchment of the truth of the said wreck, and their connection therewith. And do empower them to present and use this certificate for twenty-eight days from the date hereof, to enable them to get such temporal aid as may be adequate to reaching their respective homes, or any seaport where they may be re-engaged. And this certificate further showeth, that they are not to be interrupted in the said journey by any constabulary or other official authority. Provided, that is to say, that no breach of the peace or other cognizable offence be committed by the said petitioners. As witness our hands. John Harris, M.C. Pound 100. James Flood, J.P.100. Captain W. Hope, R.N., J.P. 1100. Given at Portsmouth, this 10th day of October, 1850. God save the Queen. Reverend W. Wilkins Pound 100. An Officer's Widow 0100. An Old Sailor 050. A Friend 026 Foot. I have already hinted at the character and description of the persons by whom these forgeries are framed. It would seem, from the example given, that such documents are available in every seaport or other considerable town, but this is not the case. It is true that certain kinds of documents, especially sham hawkers' licenses, may be had in the provinces, at prices suited to the importance of their contents, or to the probable gains of their circulation. But all the, regular bang-up fakes are manufactured in the, start, metropolis, and sent into the country to order, carefully packed up, and free from observation. The following note, sent to, Carity Poll, at Mrs. Finders Loganews fasten the oars and trumpet bear shop Han Street Westminster London with speed. 
may tend to illuminate the uninitiated as to how such fakements are obtained. Dear Paul, I hope this will find you and George in good health and spirits, things is very bad air, your sister Lizard has been confined and got a fine strap pin boy. They was very bad off when it happened. They say in me country it never rains but it pours and so it was pole. For me William has got a month along with Cockney Harry for a glim lurk and they come out next Monday nigh AV porn my new shift and every individual thing to get them a breakfast and a drop of rum the morning they comes out. They won't have no paper to work and I don't know what they will do. Taylor Tom lent me a shillin' wish I send enclosed and you must porn something for another shilling and get Joe the lawyer to write a fake for William not a glim, lost by fire, but a break say as he add a or fell down with the mad staggers and broke. All his plates and dishes and we are starving you can essay that the children is got the mezzles, they av ben ill that's no lie, and we want to raise a little money to get another animal to draw the cart put a few monikers, names, to it and make it daddy and. Date it some time Bach do not neglect and don't fail to pay the post no more at present from your Leuven sister Jane N. at Mr. John H., the sweep, next door to the Five Bells Grinstead Colchester Essex. Goodbye. The person from whom the above letter was obtained, was in the lodging house when it arrived, and had it given him to read and retain for reference. Lawyer Joe was soon sent for. And the following is an outline of the scene that occurred given in my informant's own words. I had called at the house whither the above letter had been addressed, to inquire for a man whom I had known in his and my own better days. The kitchen door, or rather cellar door, was thrust open, and in came Carity Pole herself. Well, Pole, asked the deputy, how does the world use you? B, bad, was the reply, where's lawyer Joe? Oh, he's just gone to Mother Linstead's for some tea and sugar here he comes. Joe, I've a job for you. How much do you charge for screeving of break? Oh, half a bull, half a crown, dot. No, I'll give you a do so, deaners, two shillings, cause don't ye see the poor bee, is in, stir, prison, dot. Well, well, I shan't stand for a tanner. Have you got paper? Yes, and a queen's head, and all. The pen and ink were found, a corner of the table cleared, and operations commenced. He writes a good hand, exclaimed one, as the screever wrote the petition. I wish I could do it, said another. If you could, you'd soon be transported, said a third. While the whole kitchen in one chorus, immediately on its completion, proclaimed, that it was d, d well done, adding to that, not one swell in a score would view it in any other light than a ream, genuine, concern. Lawyer Joe was up to his trade, he folded the paper in official style, creased it as if it was long written and often examined, attached the signatures of the minister and churchwardens, and dipping his fingers under the fireplace. Smeared it with ashes, and made the whole the best representation of a true account of, a horse in the mad staggers, and, a child in the measles that could be desired by the oldest and best cadger on the monkery. These professional writers are in possession of many autographs of charitable persons, and as they keep a dozen or more bottles of different shades of ink, and seldom write two documents on exactly the same sort of paper. It is difficult to detect the imposition. A famous lurker who has been previously alluded to in this work, was once taken before a magistrate at York whose own signature was attached to his fakement. The imitation was excellent, and the lurker swore hard and fast to the worthy justice that he, the justice, did write it in his own saddle room, as he was preparing to ride, and gave him five shillings, too. The effrontery and firmness of the prisoner's statement gained him his discharge. It is not uncommon in extensive districts, say, for instance, a section of a county taking in ten or a dozen townships, for a school of lurkers to keep a secretary and remit his work and his pay at the same time. In London this functionary is generally paid by commission, and sometimes partly in food, beer, and tobacco. The following is a fair estimate of the scale of charges. S.D. Friendly Letter 06. Long Ditto 09. Petition 10. Ditto, with three monikers, genuine signatures, 16. Ditto. With gammy monikers, 
forged names, 26. Very, heavy, dangerous, 30. Manuscript for a broken down author, 100. Part of a play for ditto, 76. To this I may add the prices of other articles in the begging line. Loan of one child, without grub, 09. 2 ditto, 10. Ditto, with grub and Godfrey's cordial, 09. If out after twelve at night, for each child, extra zero two. For a school of children, say half, dozen twenty six. Loan of any garment. Per day zero two. Going as a pal to vindicate any statement ten. Such is an outline, open to circumstantial variation, of the pay received for the sort of accommodation required. There is a very important species of lurking or screeving, which has not yet been alluded to. It is well known that in the colliery districts an explosion of fire damp frequently takes place, when many lives are lost. And the men who escape are often so wounded as to render amputation of a leg or arm the only probable means of saving them from the grave. Of course the accident, with every particular as to date and locality, goes the round of the newspapers. Such an event is a sort of godsend to the begging letter writer. If he is anything of a draftsman, so much the better. He then procures a sheet of vellum, and heads it with a picture of an explosion, and exhibiting men, boys, and horses up in the air, and a few nearer the ground, minus a head, a leg, or an arm. With a background of women tearing their hair, and a few little girls crying. Such a fakement, professionally filled up and put into the hands of an experienced lurker, will bring the amanuensis, or screever, two guineas at least, and the proceeds of such an expedition have in many cases averaged 60 l. per week. The lurker presenting this would have to take with him three or four countrymen, dressed in the garb of colliers, one at least knowing something of underground work. These he would engage at, a bob a knob, one shilling each, and if he made a good day, give them a, toothful o rum, beside. As such men are always left outside the jigger, door, of the houses, they are of course ignorant of the state of the subscription list. A famous lurker, to whom we have previously referred, Nicholas A., kept, a man of business to himself, and gave him from fives. To tens. Six d, per day. Nicholas, who was tolerably educated, could write very well, but as his, secretary, could imitate twelve different hands, he was of course no trifling acquisition. It would not be easy to trace the history of all, or even many of the men, who pursue the begging letter trade as professional writers. Many of the vagrant tribe write their own letters, but the vast majority are obliged to have assistance. Of course, they are sometimes detected by the fact that their conversation does not tally with the rhetorical statement of the petition. The few really deserving persons, well-born and highly educated, who subsist by begging, are very retired and cautious in their appeals. They write concisely, and their statements are generally true to a certain extent, or perhaps rigidly so in relation to an earlier part of their history. These seldom live in the very common lodging houses. The most renowned of the tribe who write for others, and whose general trade lies in forged certificates of bankruptcy, seizure of goods for rent, and medical testimonies to infirmity, is an Irishman, brought up in London and who may be seen almost every night at the bar of a certain public house in Drury Lane. He lives, or did live, at one of the model lodging houses. Very few persons know his occupation. They suppose that he is, connected with the press. Several years ago this person, says one who knew this trade well, was, regularly hard up, and made a tender of his services to a distinguished MP, who took a lively interest in the emancipation of the Jews. He offered to visit the provinces, hold meetings, and get up petitions. The Han member tested his abilities, and gave him clothes and a ten-pound note to commence operations. I saw him, says my informant, the same night, and he mooted the subject to me over a glass of whiskey punch. Not that I care, said he, if all the B, Y Jews were in H, L L, but I must do something. But how, asked my informant, will you get up the meetings, and then the signatures, you know. Meetings, was the reply, don't mention it, I can get millions of signatures. 
the pretended Jewish advocate never left London. He got, from Ireland, a box of old documents relative to bygone petitions for repeal, and and on these he put a frontispiece suited to his purpose, got them sent to Bath and Bristol, and thence transmitted to his employer, who praised his perseverance, and sent more money to the post office of one of the above-named towns. This was countermanded to London, and jovially spent at Tom Springs in Holborn. Hitherto the movements of the begging letter writer, self-considered, have been chiefly dwelt upon. There is another class of the fraternity, however, of whom some notice must here be taken, viz. Those, who to meet cases of great pretension, and consequent misgivings on the part of the noblemen or gentry to whom fakements are presented, become referees to professional beggars. These referees are kept by local schools of beggars in well-furnished apartments at respectable houses, and well-dressed, their allowance varies from 1L to 3L per week. But the most expert and least suspected dodge is referring to some dignified person in the country, a person however who exists nowhere but in imagination. Suppose, says my informant, I am a beggar, I apply to you for relief. Perhaps I state that I am in prospect of lucrative employment, if I could get enough money to clothe myself. You plead the number of impositions, I consent to that fact, but offer you references as to the truth of my statement. I refer you to the Honorable and Reverend Mr. Erskine, at Cheltenham, any name or place will do. You promise to write, and tell me to call in a few days. Meanwhile, I assume the name of the gentleman to whom I have referred you, and write forthwith to the postmaster of the town in question, requesting that any letter coming there directed to the Honorable and Reverend Mr. Erskine, may be forwarded to my present address. I thus discover what you have written, frame a flattering reply, and address it to you. I send it, under cover, to a pal of mine at Cheltenham, or elsewhere, who posts it. I call half an hour after you receive it, and, being satisfied, you give me a donation, and perhaps introduce me to some of your friends. Thus I raise a handsome sum, and the fraud is probably never found out. One of the London lurkers, who has good means of forming a calculation on the subject, assures me that the average earnings of lurkers in London alone, including those who write for them, cannot be less than 6,000L. Per annum. Two of the class were lately apprehended, at the instance of the Duke of Wellington, on their persons was found fifteen sovereigns, one five-pound note, a silver watch with gold guard, and two gold watches with a ribbon attached to each. Their subscription book showed that they had collected 620L. During the current year, a man named Mackenzie, who was transported at the last Bristol Assizes, had just received a check for 100L. From a nobleman lately deceased. Most of the professionals of this class include a copy of the court guide among their stock in trade. In this all the persons known to be charitable, have the mark set against their names. I have been furnished with a list of such persons, accompanied with comments, from the notebook of, an old stager, thirty years on the Moncury, and, as he adds, never quat but twice. The late Queen Dowager. Honorable William Ashley. The Bishop of Norwich. Sergeant Talford. Charles Dickens. Samuel Rogers, the poet. Samuel Warren, author of Extracts from the Diary of a Physician. Honorable G. C. Norton, the Beak Magistrate, but good for all that. Reverend E. Holland, Hyde Park Gardens. The late Sir Robert Peel. Countess of Essex, only good to sickness or distressed authorship. Marquis of Breadalbane, good on anything religious. The editor of The Sun. Madame Celeste. Marquis of Blandford. Duke of Portland. Duke of Devonshire. Lord George Bentinck, deceased, God Almighty wouldn't let him live, he was too good for this world. Lord Skelmersdale. Lord John Manners. Lord Littleton. Mrs. Elder, Exeter. Lady Emily Ponsonby, a devilish pretty wench. Miss Burdett Coutts. F. Stewart, E.S.Q., Bath. Mrs. Groves, Salisbury. Mrs. Mitchell, Dorchester. Mrs. 
Taggart, Bayswater, her husband is a Unitarian minister, not so good as she, but he'll stand up, Bob, if you look straight at him and keep to one story. Archdeacon Sinclair, at Kensington, but not so good as Archdeacon Pot, as was there afore him. He was a good man, he couldn't refuse a dog, much more a Christian, but he had a butler, a regular canark, who was a b, and a half, good weight. Lady Cottenham used to be good, but she is, coopered, spoilt, now, without you has a, slum, any one as she knows, and then she won't stand above a, bull, five shillings. Of the probable means of reformation. I shall now conclude this account of the patterers, lurkers, and screevers. With some observations from the pen of one who has had ample means of judging as to the effect of the several plans now in operation for the reformation or improvement of the class. In looking over the number of institutions, writes the person alluded to, designed to reform and improve the classes under review, we are, as it were, overwhelmed with their numerous branches. And though it is highly gratifying to see so much good being done, it is necessary to confine this notice to the examination of only the most prominent, with their general characteristics. The churches, on many considerations, personal feelings being the smallest, but not unknown, demand attention first. I must treat this subject, for your work is not a theological magazine, without respect to doctrine, principle, or legislation. The object of erecting churches in poor neighborhoods is to benefit the poor, why is it, then, that the instruction communicated should exercise so little influence upon the vicious, the destitute, and the outcast? Is it that Christian ordinances are less adapted to them than to others? Or, rather, is it not that the public institutions of the clergy are not made interesting to the wretched community in question? The great hindrance, in my opinion, to the progress of religion among the unsettled classes is, that having been occasionally to church or chapel, and heard nothing but doctrinal lectures or feverish mental effusions, they cannot see the application of these to everyday trade and practice. And so they arrive at the conclusion, that they can get as much or more good at home. Our preachers seem to be afraid of ascertaining the sentiments, feelings, and habits of the more wretched part of the population. And, without this, their words will die away upon the wind, and no practical echo answer their addresses. It will, perhaps, relieve the monotony of this statement if I give an illustration communicated to me by a person well acquainted to determine the merits of the question. Your readers will probably recollect the opposition experienced by D.R. Hampton on his promotion to the bishopric of Hereford. Shortly after the affair was settled, his lordship accepted an invitation to preach on behalf of the schools connected with the ten new churches of Bethnal Green. The church selected for the purpose was the one on Friars Mount. It was one July Sunday in 1849, and, as I well remember, the morning was very wet. But, supposing the curiosity, or better motives, of the public would induce a large congregation, I went to the church at half past ten. The free seats occupying the middle aisle were all filled, and chiefly with persons of the lowest and worst classes, many of whom I personally knew, and was agreeably surprised to find them in such a place. I sat in the midst of the group, and at the elbow of a tall attenuated beggar, known by the name of Lath and Plaster, of whom it is but justice to say that he repeated the responsive parts of the service very correctly. It is true he could not read. But having learned a few prayers in the Downs, Tot Hill Fields prison, he always said, M, night and morning, if he wasn't drunk, and then he said, M twice next day, cos, reasoned he, I likes to rub off as I goes on. In course of time, the bishop made his appearance in the pulpit. His subject was neglected education, and he illustrated it from the history of Eli. I thought proper to hang back, and observe the group as they passed out of church. There was Taylor Tom, and Brummagem Dick, and Keat Street Nancy, and Davy the Duke, and Stationer George, and at least two dozen more, most of whom were miserably clad, and several apparently without a shirt. They were not, however, without halfpence, and as I was well known to several of the party, and flattered as being a very knowledgeable man, I was invited to the cat and bagpipes afterwards, to have share of what was going. I was anxious, continues my informant, to learn from my companions their opinion of the right reverend prelate. 
They thought, to use their own words, he was a jolly old brick. But did they think he was sound in opinion about the Trinity, or was he, as alleged, a Unitarian? They did not even understand the meaning of these words. All they did understand was, that a top sawyer parson at Oxford, called Diar. Pussy, had made himself disagreeable, and that some of the bishops and nobility had gened him, that these had persecuted Dr. Hampton, because he was more cleverer than themselves. And that Lord John Russell, who, generally speaking, was a regular muff, had acted like a man, in this instance, and he ought to be commended for it, and, added the man who pronounced the above sentiment, it's just a picture of ourselves. To other ears than mine, the closing remark would have appeared impertinent, but I tumbled to it immediately. It was a case of oppression. And whether the oppressors belonged to Oxford University or to Scotland Yard militated nothing against the aphorism, it's just a picture of ourselves. It seems to me that these poor creatures understood the circumstances better than they did the sermon. And my inference is, that whether from the parochial pulpit, or the missionary exhortation, or in the printed form of a tract, those who wish to produce a practical effect must themselves be practical men. I, who have been in the Christian ministry, and am familiar, unhappily, with the sufferings of men of every grade among the outcast, would say, if you wish to do these poor outcasts real good, you must mold your language to their ideas. Get hold of their common phrases, those which tell so powerfully when they are speaking to each other, let them have their own fashion of things, and, where it does not interfere with order and decency. Use yourselves language which their unpolished minds will appreciate. And then, having gained their entire confidence, and, perhaps, their esteem, you may safely strike home, though it be as with a sledgehammer, and they will even love you for the smart. The temperance movement next claims attention, and I doubt not that much crime and degradation has been prevented by total abstinence from all intoxicating drinks. But I would rather raise the tone of moral feeling by intelligent and ennobling means than by those spasmodic efforts, which are without deliberation, and often without permanency. The object sought to be obtained, however, is good, so is the motive, and I leave to others to judge what means are most likely to secure it. I may also allude, as another means of reformation, to the ragged schools which are now studying the localities of the poorest neighborhoods. The object of these schools is, one would hope, to take care of the uncared for, and to give instruction to those who would be otherwise running wild and growing up as a pest to society. A few instances of real reform stand, however, in juxtaposition with many of increased hardihood. I, as a man, seeing those who resort to ragged schools, cannot understand the propriety of insulting an honest though ragged boy by classing him with a young thief. Or the hope of improving the juvenile female character where the sexes are brought in promiscuous contact, and left unrestrained on their way home to say and do everything subversive of the good instruction they have received. It is right I should here state, that these are my informant's own unbiased sentiments, delivered without communication with myself on the subject. I say thus much, because, my own opinions being known, it might perhaps appear as if I had exerted some influence over the judgment of my correspondent. The most efficient means of moral reform among the street folk, appear to have been consulted by those who, in Westminster and other places, have opened institutions cheaper, but equally efficient, as the mechanics institutes of the metropolis. In these, for one farthing per night, three halfpence a week, or sixpence a month, lectures, exhibitions, newspapers, and, are available to the very poor. These, and such as these, I humbly but earnestly would commend to public sympathy and support, believing that, under the auspices of heaven, they may deliver the outcast and poor from their own mistaken views and practices. And make them ornamental to that society to which they have long been expensive and dangerous. Another laudable attempt to improve the condition of the poorer class is by the erection of model lodging houses. The plan which induced this measure was good, and the success has been tolerable. But I am inclined to think the management of these houses, as well as their internal regulation, is scarcely what their well-meaning founders designed. The principal of these buildings is in George Street, St. Giles's. The building is spacious and well-ventilated, there is a good library, and the class of lodgers very superior to what might be expected. 
This latter circumstance makes the house in question scarcely admissible to the catalogue of reformed lodging houses for the very poor. The next model lodging house in importance is the one in Charles Street, Drury Lane. This, from personal observation, having lodged in it more than four months, says my informant, I can safely say, so far as social reform is concerned, is a miserable failure. The bedrooms are clean, but the sitting room, though large, is the scene of dirt and disorder. Noise, confusion, and intemperance abound from morning till night. There is a model lodging house in Westminster, the private property of Lord Kinnaird. It is generally well conducted. His lordship's agent visits the place once a week. There is an almost profuse supply of cooking utensils and other similar comforts. There are, moreover, two spacious reading rooms, abundance of books and periodicals, and every lodger, on payment of 6d, is provided with two lockers, one in his bedroom, and the other below stairs. The money is returned when the person leaves the house. There is divine service every day, conducted by different missionaries, and twice on Sundays. Attendance on these services is optional. And as there are two ways of ingress and egress, the devout and undevout need not come in contact with each other. The kitchen is very large and detached from the house. The master of this establishment is a man well fitted for his situation. He is a native of Saffron Walden in Essex, where his father farmed his own estate. He received a superior education, and has twice had a fortune at his own disposal. He did dispose of it, however. And, after many roving years, as a traveller, lurker, and patterer, he has settled down in his present situation, and maintained it with great credit for a considerable period. The beds in this house are only 3d. Per night, and no small praise is due to Lord Kinnaird for the superiority of this model over others of the same denomination. Such are a few of the principal of these establishments. Giving every credit to their founders, however, for purity and even excellence of motive, I doubt if model lodging houses, as at present conducted, are likely to accomplish much real good for those who get their living in the streets. Ever and anon they are visited by dukes and bishops, lords and ladies, who march in procession past every table, scrutinize every countenance, make their remarks upon the quantity and quality of food, and then go into the lobby, sign their names. Jump into their carriages, and drive away, declaring that, after all, there is not so much poverty in London as they supposed. The poor inmates of these houses, moreover, adds my informant, are kept in bondage, and made to feel that bondage, to the almost annihilation of old English independence. It is thought by the managers of these establishments, and with some share of propriety, that persons who get their living by any honest means may get home and go to bed, according to strict rule. At a certain prescribed hour, in one house it is ten o'clock, in the other's eleven. But many of the best conducted of these poor people, if they be street folk, are at those very hours in the height of their business, and have therefore to pack up their goods. And carry homeward their cumbersome and perhaps heavy load a distance usually varying from two or three to six or seven miles. If they are a minute beyond time, they are shut out, and have to seek lodgings in a strange place. On their return next morning, they are charged for the bed they were prevented from occupying, and if they demur they are at once expelled. Thus the modelled lodgers are kept, as it were, in leading strings, and triumphed over by lords and ladies, masters and matrons, who, while they pique themselves on the efforts they are making to better the condition of the poor, are making them their slaves, and driving them into unreasonable thraldom. While the rich and noble managers, reckless of their own professed benevolence, are making the poor poorer, by adding insult to wretchedness. If my remarks upon these establishments appear, adds the writer of the above remarks, to be invidious, it is only in appearance that they are so. I give their promoters credit for the best intentions, and, as far as sanitary and moral measures are concerned, I rejoice in the benefit while suggesting the improvement. Everything even moderately valuable has its counterfeit. We have counterfeit money, counterfeit virtue, counterfeit modesty, counterfeit religion, and last, but not least, counterfeit model lodging houses. 
Many private adventurers have thus dignified their domiciles, and some of them highly merit the distinction, while with others it is only a cloak for greater uncleanliness and grosser immorality. There has come to my knowledge the case of one man, who owns nearly a dozen of these dens of infamy, in one of which a poor girl under fifteen was lately ruined by a grey-headed monster, who, according to the pseudo-model regulations, slept in an adjoining bed. The sham model houses to which I more particularly allude, says my correspondent, are in Shorts Gardens, Drury Lane, Mill Yard, Cable Street, Keat Street, Flower and Dean Street, Thrall Street, Spitalfields, Plough Court, Whitechapel, and Union Court, Holborn. All of these are, without exception, twopenny brothels, headquarters of low-lived procuresses, and resorts of young thieves and prostitutes. Each of the houses is managed by a deputy, who receives an income of eights. 2d. Per week, out of which he has to provide coke, candles, soap, and c. Of course it is impossible to do this from such small resources, and the men consequently increase their salaries by, taking in couples for a little while, purchasing stolen goods, and other nefarious practices. Worse than all, the person owning these houses is a member of a strict Baptist church, and the son of a deceased minister. He lives in great splendor in one of the fashionable streets in Pimlico. It still remains for me, my correspondent continues, to contemplate the best agency for promoting the reformation of the poor. The city mission, if properly conducted, as it brings many good men in close contact with the outcast and poor, might be made productive of real and extensive good. Whether it has done so, or done so to any extent, is perhaps an open question. Our town missionary societies sprang up when our different Christian denominations were not fully alive to the apprehension of their own duties to their poorer brethren, who were lost to principle, conscience, and society. That the object of the London City Mission is most noble, needs no discussion, and admits of no dispute. The method of carrying out this great object is by employing agents, who are required to give their whole time to the work, without engaging in any secular concerns of life. And regarding the operation of the work so done, I must say that great good has resulted from the enterprise. At the commencement of the labors of the mission in any particular locality great opposition was manifested, and a great amount of prejudice, with habits of the most immoral kind, openly carried on without any public censure, had to be overcome. The statements of the missionaries have from time to time been published, and lie recorded against us as a nation, of the glaring evils and ignorance of a vast portion of our people. It is principally owing to the city missionaries that the other portions of society have known what they now do of the practices and habits of the poor. It is principally due to their exertions that schools have been established in connection with their labors, and the ragged schools, one of the principal movements of the last few years, are mainly to be attributed to their efforts. A man, says my informant in conclusion, can receive little benefit from a thing he does not understand. The talk which will do for the senate will not do for the cottage, and the argument which will do for the study will not do for the man who spends all his spare time in a public house. These remarks will apply to the distribution of tracts, which should be couched in the very language that is used by the people to whom they are addressed, then the ideas will penetrate their understanding. Some years back I met with an old sailor in a lodging house in Westminster, who professed a belief that there had once been a god, but that he was either dead, or grown old and diseased. He did not dispute the inspiration of the Bible. He believed that there had been revelations made to our forefathers when God was alive and active, but that now the Almighty did not fash, trouble, himself about his creatures at all. I endeavored to instruct the man in his own rude language and ideas. And after he had thus been made to comprehend the doctrine of the atonement, he said, I see it all plain enough, though I've liked a drop o' oh, drink, and been a devil among the gals, and all that, in my time. If I'll humble myself I can have it all wiped off. And, as the song says, we may be happy yet, because, as the saying is, it's all square with God Almighty. Whether the sailor permanently reformed, I am unable to say, for I lost sight of him shortly after. At any rate he understood the subject, and was thus qualified to profit by it. And what can the teachers of Christianity among the British heathen, herded together in courts and alleys, 
tell their poor ignorant hearers better than the old sailor's aphorism, you have, indeed, gone astray from your greatest and best friend, but, if you so desire, you may be happy yet, because it's all square with God Almighty. Before quitting this subject, I would add, if you really wish to do these poor creatures good, you must remember that your instructions are not intended for so-called fashionable society, but for those who have a fashion of their own. If you lose sight of this fact, your words will die away upon the wind, and no echo in the hearts of these poor people will answer your addresses. The above observations are from the pen of one who has not only had the means, but is likewise possessed of the power of judging as to the effect of the several plans, now in course of operation, for the reformation and improvement of the London poor. I have given the comments in the writer's own language, because I was anxious that the public should know the opinions of the best informed of the street people themselves on this subject. And I trust one need not say that I have sought in no way to influence my correspondent's judgment. I now subjoin a communication from a clergyman in the country, touching the character of the tramps and lurkers frequenting his neighborhood, together with some suggestions concerning the means of improving the condition of the London poor. These I append, because it is advisable that in so difficult a matter the sentiments of every one having sufficient experience, judgment, and heart to fit him to speak on the subject should be calmly attended to. So that amid much counsel there may be at least some little wisdom. The subject of the welfare of our poorer brethren was one which engaged much of my attention twenty years ago, when studying for the bar at Lincoln's Inn, before I entered into orders, and the inquiries, and then made by me in reference to London, are recalled by many of your pages. I have pursued the same course, according to my limited means and opportunities, for my benefice, like thousands of others, is but one hundred l. a year, in this neighborhood, and there are very many of my clerical brethren, also, deeply anxious and exerting their means for the country poor. The details given in your numbers as to the country tramps and patterers, I can fully corroborate from personal experience and knowledge, so far as the country part of it. We never give money to beggars here, on any pretense whatever. We never give clothes. We never give relief to a naked or half-naked man if we can avoid it, the imposture is too barefaced. Medicine I do give occasionally to the sick, or pretended sick, and see them take it. Every beggar may have dry bread, or three or four tracts to sell, but never both. I know we are even thus often imposed on, but it is better to run this risk than to turn away, by chance, a starving man. And I do see the mendicants often sit down on a field near, and eat the dry bread with ravenous look. The tramp sometimes come to church on Sunday, and then beg, but we never give even bread on Sunday, because on that day they can get help at the union workhouse, and it only tempts idlers. Sometimes we are days without a beggar, and then there will be ten to twenty per day, and then all at once the stream stops. There are no tramp lodging houses in my parish, which is a village of six hundred or seven hundred people. Most of the burglaries hereabout seem connected with some inroad of tramps into the neighborhood. The lodging houses are very bad in some of the small towns near, but somehow the magistrates cannot get them put down. The gentry are alive here to the evil of crowded cottages, and, and are using efforts to build better and more decent ones. But the evil results from the little landowners, who have an acre or two, or less, and build rows of cottages on them of the scantiest dimensions, at high rents, ten per cent on the cost of building. The rents of the gentry and nobility are very moderate to the poor, viz., scarcely two per cent, beyond the yearly repairs, on the market value of the cottage. In 1832 I succeeded in getting land allotments for the poor here, and most of the parishes round have followed our example since. The success to the poor has always depended on the rent being a real rent, such as is paid by the land roundabout, and on the rules of good management and of payment of rent being rigidly enforced. The character of the poor of England must be raised, as well as their independence. They must not be left to lean on charity. I am sure that the sterling worth of the English character can only be raised by that means to the surface of society among the poor. The English is a fine material, but the poor neither value, nor are benefited, by mawkish nonsense or excessive feeling. 
I believe this parish was one of the most fearfully demoralized twenty years ago. It was said there was not one young female Kateger of virtuous character. There was not one man who was not, or had not been, a drunkard, and theft, fighting, and, and, were universal. It is greatly better now, totally different, and I attribute the change to the land allotments, the Provident Society, the Village Horticultural Society, the Lending Library, the Clothing Club, the Coal Club, the Cultivating a Taste for Music, and, and, as subsidiary to the more directly pastoral work of a clergyman, and the schools, and, I am probably visionary in my ideas, but the perusal of your pages has led me to think that, were I clergyman of a parish where the street folks lived, I should aim at some schemes of this style. In addition to the benefit society and loan society, the last most important, as proposed by yourself. 1. To get music taught at one half d. A week, or something of the kind, a ragged school music room, if the people would learn gratis, would be still better, as a step to a superior music class at 1d. Per week. 2. To get the poor to adorn their rooms plentifully with a better class of pictures, of places, of people, of natural history, and of historical and religious subjects, just as they might like. And a circulating library for pictures if they preferred change. This I find takes with the village poor. Provide these things excessively cheap for them, at nominal prices, just high enough to prevent them being sold at a profit by the poor. 3. To establish a monthly or fortnightly sheet, or little book for the poor, at one half d, or some trifle, full of pictures such as they would like, but free from impropriety. It might be called the Coster's Barrow, or some name which would take their fancy, and contain pictures for those who cannot read, and reading for those who can. Its contents should be instructive, and yet lively. As for instance, the History of London Bridge, History of a Codfish, Travels of Welks, Dreams of St. Paul's, Old History of England, Boys from the Bottom of the Coal Exchange, Roman Tales, True Tale of Trafalgar, and k, and k. All very short articles, at which perhaps they might be angry, or praise, or abuse, or do anything, but still would read, or hear, and talk about. If possible, the little work might have a corner called, The Next World's Page, or any name of the kind, with nothing in it but the Lord's Prayer, or the Creed, or the Ten Commandments, or a parable, or miracle. Or discourse of Christ's, in the exact words of Scripture, without any commentary. Which could neither annoy the Roman Catholics nor others. Those parts in which the Douay version differs from ours might be avoided, and the Romanists be given to understand that they would always be avoided. The more difficult question of cheap amusements instead of the demoralizing ones now popular, is one which as yet I cannot see my way through, but it is one which must be grappled with if any good is to be done. I write thus, adds my correspondent, because I feel you are a fellow worker, so far as your labors show it, for the cause of God's poor, and therefore will sympathize in anything another worker can say from experience on the same subject. Such are the opinions of two of my correspondents, each looking at the subject from different points of view, the one living among the people of whom he treats. And daily witnessing the effects of the several plans now in operation for the moral and physical improvement of the poor, and the other infrequent intercourse with the tramps and lurkers, on their vagrant excursions through the country. As well as with the resident poor of his own parish, the former living in friendly communion with those of whom he writes, and the latter visiting them as their spiritual adviser and material benefactor. I would, however, before passing to the consideration of the next subject, here pause to draw special attention to the distinctive features of the several classes of people obtaining their livelihood in the streets. These viewed in regard to the causes which have induced them to adopt this mode of life, may be arranged in three different groups, viz. 1. Those who are bred to the streets. 2. Those who take to the streets. 3. Those who are driven to the streets. The class bred to the streets are those whose fathers having been street sellers before them, have sent them out into the thoroughfares at an early age to sell either watercresses, lavender, oranges, nuts, flowers, apples, onions, and as a means of eking out the family income. Of such street apprenticeship several notable instances have already been given. 
and one or two classes of juvenile street sellers, as the Lucifer Match and the Blacking Sellers, still remain to be described. Another class of street apprentice is to be found in the boys engaged to wheel the barrows of the costers, and who are thus at an early age tutored in all the art and mystery of street traffic, and who rarely abandon it at maturity. These two classes may be said to constitute the natives of the streets, the tribe indigenous to the paving stones, imbibing the habits and morals of the gutters almost with their mother's milk. To expect that children thus nursed in the lap of the kennel, should when men not bear the impress of the circumstances amid which they have been reared, is to expect to find costermongers heroes instead of ordinary human beings. We might as well blame the various races on the face of the earth for those several geographical peculiarities of taste, which constitute their national characteristics. Surely there is a moral acclimatization as well as a physical one, and the heart may become inured to a particular atmosphere in the same manner as the body. And even as the seed of the apple returns, unless grafted, to its original crab, so does the child, without training, go back to its parent stock, the vagabond savage. For the bred and born street seller, who inherits a barrow as some do coronets, to be other than he is, it has here been repeatedly enunciated, is no fault of his but of ours, who could and yet will not move to make him otherwise. Might not the finest gentleman in Europe have been the greatest blackguard in Billingsgate, had he been born to carry a fish basket on his head instead of a crown? And by a parody of reasoning let the roughest rough outside the London fish market have had his lot in life cast, by the grace of God, King, Defender of the Faith. And surely his shoulders would have glittered with diamond epaulets instead of fish scales. I say thus much, to impress upon the reader a deep and devout sense, that we who have been appointed to another state, are, by the grace of God, what we are, and from no special merit of our own, to which, in the arrogance of our self-conceit, we are too prone to attribute the social and moral differences of our nature. Go to a lady of fashion and tell her she could have even become a fish fag, and she will think you some mad ethnologist, if indeed she had ever heard of the science. Let me not, however, while thus seeking to impress the reader's mind with a sense of the antecedents of the human character, be thought to espouse the doctrine that men are merely the creatures of events. All I wish to enforce is, that the three common causes of the social and moral differences of individuals are to be found in race, organization, and circumstances, that none of us are entirely proof against the influence of these three conditions, the ethnological, the physiological, and the associative elements of our idiosyncrasy. But, while I admit the full force of external nature upon us all, while I allow that we are, in many respects, merely patients, still I cannot but perceive that, in other respects we are self-agents, moving rather than being moved. By events, often stemming the current of circumstances, and at other times giving to it a special direction rather than being swept along with it. I am conscious that it is this directive and controlling power, not only over external events, but over the events of my own nature, that distinguishes me as well from the brood of the fields as it does my waking from my sleeping moments. I know, moreover, that in proportion as a man is active or passive in his operations, so is his humanity or brutality developed, that true greatness lies in the superiority of the internal forces over the external ones. And that as heroes, or extraordinary men are heroes, because they overcome the sway of one or other, or all, of the three material influences above named, so ordinary people are ordinary. Simply because they lack energy, principle, will, call it what you please, to overcome the material elements of their nature with the spiritual. And it is precisely because I know this, that I do know that those who are bred to the streets must bear about them the moral impress of the kennel and the gutter, unless we seek to develop the inward and controlling part of their constitution. If we allow them to remain the creatures of circumstances, to wander through life principleless, purposeless, conscienceless, if it be their lot to be flung on the wide waste of waters without a guiding star above, or a rudder or compass within. How can we, the well-fed, dare to blame them because, wanting bread, they pray and live upon their fellow creatures? I say thus much, because I feel satisfied that a large portion of the street folk, and especially those who have been bred to the business, are of improvable natures, that they crave knowledge, as starving men for, the staff of life. 
that they are most grateful for instruction. That they are as deeply moved by any kindness and sympathy, when once their suspicion has been overcome, as they are excited by any wrong or oppression, and I say it moreover. Because I feel thoroughly convinced of the ineffectiveness of the present educational resources for the poor. We think, if we teach them reading and writing, and to chatter a creed, that we have armed them against the temptations, the trials, and the exasperations of life, believing. Because we have put the knife and fork in their hands that we have really filled with food the empty bellies of their brains. We exercise their memories, make them human parrots, and then wonder that they do not act as human beings. The intellect, the conscience, the taste, indeed all that refines, enlightens, and ennobles our nature, we leave untouched, to shrivel and wither like unused limbs. The beautiful, the admirable, the true, the right, are as hidden to them as at their first day's schooling. We impress them with no purpose, animate them with no principle. They are still the same brute creatures of circumstances, the same passive instruments, human waifs and strays, left to be blown about as the storms of life may whirl them. Of the second group, or those who take to the streets, I entertain very different opinions. This class is distinguished from that above mentioned, in being wanderers by choice, rather than wanderers by necessity. In the early chapters of this work, I strove to point out to my readers that the human race universally consisted of two distinct classes, the wanderers and the settlers, the civilized and the savage, those who produced their food, and those who merely collected it. I sought further to show, that these two classes were not necessarily isolated, but that, on the contrary, almost every civilized tribe had its nomadic race, like parasites, living upon it. These nomadic races I proved, moreover, to have several characteristics common to the class, one of the most remarkable of which was, their adoption of a secret language, with the intent of concealing their designs and exploits. Strange to say, I then observed, that despite its privations, dangers, and hardships, those who have once taken to a wandering life rarely abandon it. There are countless instances, I added, of white men adopting all the usages of an Indian hunter, but there is not one example of the Indian hunter or trapper, adopting the steady and regular habits of civilized society. That this passion for, a roving life, to use the common expression by which many of the street people themselves designate it, is a marked feature of some natures. There cannot be a doubt in the mind of any one who has contemplated even the surface differences of human beings. And nevertheless it is a point to which no social philosopher has yet drawn attention. To my mind, it is essentially the physical cause of crime. Too restive and volatile to pursue the slow process of production, the wanderers, and consequently the collectors, of subsistence must, in a land where all things are appropriated, live upon the stock of the producers. The nomadic or vagrant class have all an universal type, whether they be the bushmen of Africa or the tramps of our own country, and Mr. Knapp, the intelligent master of the Wandsworth and Clapham Union, to whom I was referred at the time of my investigations touching the subject of vagrancy, as having the greatest experience upon the matter, gave me the following graphic account. Which, as I said at the time of its first publication, had perhaps never been surpassed as an analysis of the habits and propensities of the vagabond class. Ignorance, to use the gentleman's own words, is certainly not their prevailing characteristic, indeed, with a few exceptions, it is the reverse. The vagrants are mostly distinguished by their aversion to continuous labor of any kind. He never knew them to work. Their great inclination is to be on the move, and wandering from place to place, and they appear to receive a great deal of pleasure from the assembly and conversation of the casual ward. They are physically stout and healthy, and certainly not emaciated or sickly. They belong especially to the able-bodied class, being, as he says, full of health and mischief. They are very stubborn and self-willed. They are a most difficult class to govern, and are especially restive under the least restraint, they can ill brook control, and they find great delight in thwarting the authorities. They are particularly fond of amusements of all kinds. He never knew them love reading. They mostly pass under fictitious names. They are particularly distinguished by their libidinous propensities. 
they are not remarkable for a love of drink. He considers them to be generally a class possessing the keenest intellect, and of a highly enterprising character. They seem to have no sense of danger, and to be especially delighted with such acts as involve any peril. They are likewise characterized by their exceeding love of mischief. They generally are of a most restless and volatile disposition. They have great quickness of perception, but little power of continuous attention or perseverance. They have a keen sense of the ridiculous, and are not devoid of deep feeling. In the summer they make regular tours through the country, visiting all places that they have not seen. They are perfectly organized, so that any regulation affecting their comforts or interests becomes known among the whole body in a remarkably short space of time. Every day my inquiries add some fresh proof to the justice of the above enumeration of the several phenomena distinguishing this class. To the more sedate portion of the human family, the attractions of a roving life are inexplicable. Nevertheless, there can be no doubt that, to the more volatile, the mere muscular exercise and the continual change of scene, together with the wild delight which attends the overcoming of any danger, are sources of pleasure sufficient to compensate for all the privations and hardships attending such a state of existence. Mr. Ruxton, one of the many who have passed from settlers to wanderers, has given us the following description of the enjoyments of a life in the wilderness. Although liable to an accusation of barbarism, I must confess that the very happiest moments of my life have been spent in the wilderness of the far west. And I never recall, but with pleasure, the remembrance of my solitary camp in the Bayou Solade, with no friend near me more faithful than my rifle, and no companions more sociable than my good horse and mules. Or the attendant Cayuta which nightly serenaded us. Seldom did I ever wish to change such hours of freedom for all the luxuries of civilized life. And unnatural and extraordinary as it may appear, yet such is the fascination of the life of the mountain hunter, that I believe not one instance could be adduced of even the most polished and civilized of men. Who had once tasted the sweets of its attendant liberty and freedom from every worldly care, not regretting the moment when he exchanged it for the monotonous life of the settlements. Nor sighing and sighing again once more to partake of its pleasures and allurements. To this class of voluntary wanderers belong those who take to the streets, glad to exchange the wearisomeness and restraint of a settled occupation for the greater freedom and license of a nomad mode of life. As a class, they are essentially the non-working, preferring, as I said before, to collect, rather than produce, what they eat. If they sell, they do so because for sundry reasons they fear to infringe the law, and as traders their transactions certainly are not marked by an excess of honesty. I am not aware that any of them are professional thieves, for these are the more daring portion of the same vagrant fraternity. Though the majority assuredly are habitual cheats, delighting in proving their cleverness by imposing upon simple-minded citizens, viewing all society as composed of the same dishonest elements as their own tribes and looking upon all sympathy and sacrifice, even when made for their own benefit, as some artful dodge or trick, by which to snare them. It should be remembered, however, that there are many grades of vagrants among us, and that though they are all essentially non-producing and, consequently, predatory, still many are in no way distinguished from a large portion of even our wealthy tradesmen, our puffing grocers and slop sellers. To attempt to improve the condition of the voluntary street sellers by teaching of any kind, would be to talk to the wind. We might as well preach to Messrs. Moses, Nickel, and Company, in the hope of Christianizing them. Those who take to the streets are not, like those who are bred to it, an uneducated class. They are intelligent and knowing enough, and it is this development of their intellect at the expense of their conscience which gives rise to that excessive admiration of mere cleverness which makes skill the sole standard of excellence with them. They approve, admire, venerate nothing but what is ingenious. Wrong with them is mere folly, right, cunning. And those who think the simple cultivation of the intellect the great social panacea of the time, have merely to study the characteristics of this class to see how a certain style of education can breed the very vice it seeks to destroy. Years ago, I wrote and printed the following passage, and every year since my studies have convinced me more and more of its truth. 
Man, if deprived of his intellect, would be the most miserable and destitute, if of his sympathy. The most savage and cunning, of all the brute creation, consequently, we may infer that, according as solely the one or the other of these powers is expanded in us. So shall we approximate in our nature either to the instinct of the brute or to the artifice of the demon, and that only when they are developed in an equal degree, can man be said to be educated as man. We should remember that the intellect simply executes, it is either the selfish or moral propensity that designs. The intellectual principle enables us to perceive the means of attaining any particular object. It is the selfish or else the moral principle in us, that causes us originally to desire that object. The two latter principles are the springs, the former is merely the instrument of all human action. They are masters, whereas the intellect is but the servant of the will. And hence it is evident that in proportion as the one or the other of these two predominant principles, as either the selfish or the moral disposition is adduced in man. And thus made the chief director and stimulus of the intellectual power within him, so will the cultivation of that power be the source of happiness or misery to himself and others. The third and last class, namely, those who are driven to the streets, is almost as large as any. Luckily, those who take to that mode of life, are by far the least numerous portion of the street folk. And if those who are bred to the business are worthy of our pity, assuredly those who are driven to it are equally, if not more, so. With some who are deprived of the means of obtaining a maintenance for themselves, the sale of small articles in the streets may, perhaps, be an excuse for begging. But in most cases, I am convinced it is adopted from a horror of the workhouse, and a disposition to do, at least, something for the food they eat. Often is it the last struggle of independence, the desire to give something like an equivalent for what they receive. Over and over again have I noticed this honorable pride, even in individuals who, from some privations or affliction that rendered them utterly incompetent to labor for their living, had a just claim on our sympathies and assistance. The blind, the cripple, the maimed, the very old, the very young, all have generally adopted a street life, because they could do nothing else. With many it is the last resort of all. The smallness of the stock money required, for a shilling, it has been shown, is sufficient to commence several street trades, is one of the principal causes of so many of those who are helpless taking to the street traffic. Moreover, the severity of the poor laws and the degradation of pauperism, and the aversion to be thought a common beggar by all, except the very lowest, are, I have no doubt, strong incentives to this course. There are many callings which are peculiar, as being followed principally by the disabled. The majority of the blind are musicians, or bootlace or tape sellers. The very old are sellers of watercresses, lucifers, pincushions, ballads, and pins and needles, staylaces, and such small articles as are light to carry, and require but a few pence for the outlay. The very young are sellers of flowers, oranges, nuts, onions, blacking, lucifers, and the like. Many of those who have lost an arm, or a leg, or a hand, turn showmen, or become sellers of small metal articles, as knives or nutmeg graters. And many who have been born cripples may be seen in the street struggling for self-support. But all who are driven to the streets have not been physically disabled for labor. Some have been reduced from their position as tradesmen or shopmen. Others, again, have been gentlemen servants and clerks, all, dragged down by a series of misfortunes, sometimes beyond their control, and sometimes brought about by their own imprudence or sluggishness. As we have seen, many are reduced to a state of poverty by long illness, and on their recovery are unable, from want of clothes or friends, to follow any other occupation. But a still larger class than all, are the beaten-out mechanics and artisans, who, from want of employment in their own trade, take to make up small things, as clothes horses, tinware, cutlery, brushes, pails, caps, and bonnets, on their own account. The number of artisans in the London streets speaks volumes for the independence of the working men of this country, as well as for the difficulty of their obtaining employment at their own trades. Those who are unacquainted with the sterling pride of the destitute English mechanic, know not what he will suffer before becoming an inmate of a workhouse, or sinking to the debasement of a beggar. 
that handicrafts men do occasionally pass into lurkers, I know well. But these, I am convinced, have gradually been warped to the life by a long course of tramping, aided by the funds of their societies, and thus becoming disused to labor, have, after forfeiting all claims upon the funds of their trade, adopted beggary as a means of subsistence. But, that this is the exception rather than the rule, the following is sufficient to show. The destitute mechanics, said the master of the Wandsworth and Clapham Union to me, are entirely a different class from the regular vagrants. They have different habits, and indeed different features. During the whole of my experience I never knew a distressed artisan who applied for a night's shelter, commit an act of theft. And I have seen them, he added, in the last stage of destitution. Occasionally they have sold the shirt and waistcoat off their backs before they applied for admittance into the workhouse, while some of them have been so weak from long starvation that they could scarcely reach the gate. And indeed had to be kept for several days in the infirmary before their strength was recruited sufficiently to continue their journey. The poor mechanic, said another of my informants, will sit in the casual ward like a lost man, scared. It's shocking to think a decent mechanic's houseless. When he's beat out he's like a bird out of a cage. He doesn't know where to go, or how to get a bit. I shall avail myself of another occasion to discuss the means of improving the condition of the street people. Of the street sellers of manufactured articles. These traders consist of, 1, the vendors of metal articles, 2, of chemical articles, 3, of china, glass, and stone articles, 4, of linen, cotton, and other textile fabrics, and, 5, of miscellaneous articles. In this classification I do not include second-hand articles, nor yet the traffic of those who make the articles they sell, and who are indeed street artisans rather than street sellers. Under the first head are included, the vendors of razors, table and pen knives, tea trays, dog collars, keyrings, articles of hardware, small coins and metals, pins and needles, jewelry, snuffers, candlesticks, articles of tinware, tools. Card counters, herring toasters, trivets, gridirons, pans, tray stands, as in the roasting of meat, and Dutch ovens. Of the second description are the vendors of blacking, black lead, lucifer matches, corn salves, grease removing compositions, china and glass cements, plating balls, rat and beetle poisons, crackers, detonating balls, and cigar lights. Under the third head come all street sold articles of china, glass, or stone manufacture, including not only crockery, but vases, chimney ornaments, and stone fruit. The fourth head presents the street vending of cotton, silken, and linen manufactures. Such as sheetings, shirtings, a variety of laces, so ing cotton, threads and tapes, articles of haberdashery and of millinery, artificial flowers, handkerchiefs, and pretended smuggled goods. Among the fifth class, or the miscellaneous street sellers, are those who vend cigars, pipes, tobacco and snuff boxes and cigar cases, accordions, spectacles, hats, sponge, combs and hairbrushes, shirt buttons and coat studs, lots, rhubarb, wash leather, paper hangings, dolls, bristol and other toys, sawdust, firewood, and pincushions. There are many other manufactured articles sold in the streets, but their description will be more proper under the head of street artisans. The street sellers of manufactured articles present, as a body, so many and often such varying characteristics, that I cannot offer to give a description of them as a whole, as I have been able to do with other and less diversified classes. Among them are several distinct and peculiar street characters, such as the pack men, who carry their cotton or linen goods in packs on their backs, and are all itinerants. Then there are duffers, who vend pretended smuggled goods, handkerchiefs, silks, tobacco or cigars, also, the sellers of sham sovereigns and sham gold rings for wagers. The crockery ware and glass sellers, known in the street trade as crocs, are peculiar from their principle of bartering. They will sell to any one, but they sell very rarely, and always clamor in preference for an exchange of their wares for wearing apparel of any kind. They state, if questioned, that their reason for doing this is, at least I heard the statement from some of the most intelligent among them, that they do so because, if they, sold outright, they required a hawker's license. 
and could not sell or swap so cheap. Some of the street sellers of manufactured articles are also patterers. Among these are the cheap jacks or cheap johns, the grease and stain removers, the corn salve and plate ball vendors, the sellers of sovereigns and rings for wagers. A portion of the lot sellers, and the men who vend poison for vermin and go about the streets with live rats clinging to, or running about, their persons. This class of street sellers also includes many of the very old and the very young. The diseased, crippled, maimed, and blind. These poor creatures sell, and sometimes obtain a charitable penny, by offering to sell such things as boxes of lucifer matches, cakes of blacking, boot, stay, and other laces. Pins, and sewing and knitting needles, tapes, cotton bobbins, garters, pincushions, combs, nutmeg graters, metal skewers and meat hooks, hooks and eyes, and shirt buttons. The rest of the class may be described as merely street sellers. Toiling, struggling, plodding, itinerant tradesmen. Of the street sellers of manufactured. Articles in metal. These street sellers are less numerous than might be imagined, when, according to my present division, the class is confined to the sellers of articles which they do not manufacture. The metal wares thus sold I have already enumerated, and I have now to describe the characteristics of the sellers. The result of my inquiries leads me to the conclusion, that the street vendors of any article which is the product of the skill of the handicraftsman, have been, almost always, in their first outset in a street life. Connected in some capacity or other with the trade, the manufactures of which they vend. One elderly man, long familiar with this branch of the street trade, expressed to me his conviction that when a mechanic sought his livelihood in the streets, he naturally gave his mind to sell what he understood. Now, in my own case, continued my informant, I was born and bred a tinman, and when I was driven to a street life, I never thought of selling anything but tins. How could I, if I wished to do the thing square and proper. It would be like trying to speak another language. If I'd started on slippers, and I knew a poor man who was set up in the streets by a charitable lady on a stock of gentlemen's slippers, what could I have done? Why, no better than he told me he did. He was a potter down at Deptford, and knew of nothing but flower pots, and honey jars for grocers, and them red sorts of pottery. Poor fellow, he might have died of hunger only the cholera came quickest. But when I'm questioned about my tins, I'm my own man, and it's a great thing, I'm satisfied, in a street trade, when there's so many cheap shops, and the police and all again you, to understand the goods you're talking about. This statement, I may repeat, is undoubtedly correct, so far as that a, beaten out, mechanic, when driven to the streets, in the first instance offers to the public wares of which he understands the value and quality. Afterwards, in the experience or vagaries of a street life, other commodities may be, or may appear to be, more remunerative, and for such the mechanic may relinquish his first articles of street traffic. Why, sir, I was told, there was one man who left razors for cabbages. Cause one day a costermonger what lived in the same house with him and was taken ill. Asked him to go out with a barrow of summer cabbages, the costermonger's boy went with him and they went off so well that Joe, the former razor seller, managed to start in the costering line, he was so encouraged. The street trade in metal manufactured articles is principally itinerant. Perhaps during the week upwards of three-fourths of those carrying it on are itinerant, while on a Saturday night, perhaps, all are stationary, and almost always in the street markets. The itinerant trade is carried on, and chiefly in the suburbs, by men, women, and children but the children are always, or almost always, the offspring of the adult street sellers. The metals sold in the street may be divided into street hardware, street tinware, and street jewelry. I shall begin with the former. The street sellers of hardware are, I am assured, in number about 100, including single men and families. For women, take their share in the business, and children sell smaller things, such as snuffers or bread baskets. The people pursuing the trade are of the class I have above described, with the exception of some ten or twelve who formerly made a living as servants to the gaming booths at Epsom, Ascot, and K. 
and manage to live out of the races, somehow, most of the year, since the gaming booths have been disallowed, they have taken to the street hardware. All these street sellers obtain their supplies at the swag shops. Of which I shall speak hereafter. The main articles of their trade are tea boards, waiters, snuffers, candlesticks, bread baskets, cheese trays, Britannia metal teapots and spoons, iron kettles, pans, and coffee pots. The most saleable things, I am told by a man who has been fifteen years in this and similar street trades, are at present eighteen inches. Tea boards, bought at, the swags, at from tens. Six D a dozen, to fours. Each, twenty-four inches. Boards, from twenties. The dozen to fives. Each. Bread baskets, fours. Six D the dozen, and Britannia metal teapots, tens. The dozen. These teapots have generally what is called loaded bottoms. The lower part of the vessel is filled with composition, so as to look as if there was great weight of metal, and as if the pot would melt for almost the 18d. Which is asked for it, and very often got. I learn from the same man, however, and from others in the trade, that it is far more difficult now than it was a few years ago, to sell rubbish. There used to be also, but not within these six or eight years, a tolerable profit realized by the street sellers of hardware in the way of swap. It was common to take an old metal article, as part payment for a new one. And if the old article were of good quality, it was polished and tinkered up for sale in the Saturday evening street markets, and often went off well. This traffic, however, has almost ceased to exist, as regards the street sellers of hardware, and has been all but monopolized by the men who barter crocs for wearing apparel or any old metal. Some hardware men who have become well known on their rounds, for the principal trade is in the suburbs, sell very good wares, and at moderate profits. It's a poor trade, sir, is the hardware, said one man carrying it on, and street trades are mostly poor trades, for I've tried many a one of them. I was brought up a clown, I may say. My father died when I was a child, and I might have been a clown still but for an accident, a rupture. That's long ago, I can't say how long, but I know that before I was fifteen, I many a time wished I was dead, and I have many a time since. Why the day before yesterday, from nine in the morning to eleven at night, I didn't take a farthing. Some days I don't earn ones, and I have a mother depending upon me who can do little or nothing. I'm a teetotaler. If I wasn't we shouldn't have a meal a day. I never was fond of drink, and if I'm ever so weary and out of sorts, and worried for a meal's meat, I can't say I ever long for a drop to cheer me up. Sometimes I can't get coffee, let alone anything else. Oh, I suffer terribly. Day after day I get wet through, and have nothing to take home to my mother at last. Our principal food is bread and butter, and tea. Not fish half so often as many poor people. I suppose, because we don't care for it. I know that our living, the two of us, stands to less than ones. A day, not six d. A piece. Then I have two rents to pay. No, sir, not for two places, but I pay twos. A week for a room, a tidy bit of a chamber, furnished, and ones. A week rent, I call it rent, for a loan of fives. I've paid ones. A week for four weeks on it, and must keep paying until I can hand over the fives, with ones. For rent added to it, all in one sum. If I could tip up the fives. The day after I'd paid the last week's ones, I must pay another shilling. The man who lends does nothing else. He lives by lending, and by letting out a few barrows to costermongers, and other street people. I wish I could take a farewell sight of them. The principal traffic carried on by these street sellers is in the suburbs. Women constitute their sole customers, or nearly so. Their profits fluctuate from 20% to 100%. The bread baskets, which they buy at fours. 6d, the dozen, they retail at 6d. Each. For it is very difficult, I have frequently been told, to get a price between 6d. 
and ones. This, however, relates only to those things which are not articles of actual necessity. Half of these street sellers, I am assured, take on an average from twenties to twenty-fives. Weekly the year through, a quarter take fifteenths, and the remaining quarter from sevens. Six D to tens. Calculating an average taking of fifteenths. Each per week, throughout the entire class, men, women, and children, we find three nine hundred L. Expended in street sold hardwares. Ten years ago, I am told, the takings were not less than two zero 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 L. The following is an extract from accounts kept, not long ago, by a street seller of hardware. His principal sale was snuffers, knives and forks, iron candlesticks, padlocks, and bed screws. His stock cost him thirty fives. On the Monday morning, and his first week was his best, which I here subjoin. Receipts, profits. Monday eights. Threes, zero D. Tuesday 523. Wednesday 416. Thursday, always a slack day, 3. Friday, a better day about the docks, when people are paid, 730. Saturday morning and even point 2361. The following is the worst week in the account books. The street seller after this, about half a year ago, sold his stock to a small shopkeeper, and went into another business. Receipts, Profits SDSD Monday, Very Cold, A Common Bed, Screw 040114 Tuesday Wednesday 1005 Thursday, Sold Cheap, 1103 Friday Saturday 1708 401514 Of the Cheap Johns, or Street Hanselers this class of street salesmen, who are perhaps the largest dealers of all in hardware, are not so numerous as they were some few years ago, the excise laws, as I have before remarked, having interfered with their business. The principal portion of those I have met are Irishmen, who, notwithstanding, generally hail from Sheffield, and all their sales are effected in an attempt at the Yorkshire dialect, interspersed, however, with an unmistakable brogue. The brogue is the more apparent when Cheap John gets a little out of temper, if his sales are flat, for instance, he'll say, by J, S, I don't believe you've any money with you, or that you've lift any at home, at all, at all. Bad says to you. There are, however, many English Cheap Johns, but few of them are natives of Sheffield or Birmingham, from which towns they invariably hail. Their system of selling is to attract a crowd of persons by an harangue after the following fashion, Here I am, the original cheap John from Sheffield. I've not come here to get money, not I. I've come here merely for the good of the public, and to let you see how you've been imposed upon by a parcel of pompous shopkeepers, who are not content with less than 100%, for rubbish. They got up a petition, which I haven't time to read to you just now, offering me a large sum of money to keep away from here. But no, I had too much friendship for you to consent, and here I am, cheap John, born without a shirt, one day while my mother was out, in a haystack. Consequently I've no parish, for the cows eat up mine, and therefore I've never no fear of going to the workhouse. I've more money than the parson of the parish, I've in this cart a cargo of useful and cheap goods. Can supply you with anything, from a needle to an anchor. Nobody can sell as cheap as me, seeing that I gets all my goods upon credit, and never means to pay for them. Now then, what shall we begin with? Here's a beautiful guard chain. If it isn't silver, it's the same color, I don't say it isn't silver, nor I don't say it is, in that affair use your own judgment. Now, in the Reglar way of trade, you shall go into any shop in town, and they will ask you one L. 18th, 6d. For an article not half so good, so what will you say for this splendid chain? 18 and sixpence without the pound? What, that's too much. Well, then say 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10 shillings. What, none of you give 10 shillings for this beautiful article? 
see how it improves a man's appearance, hanging the chain round his neck. Any young man here present wearing this chain will always be shown into the parlor instead of the taproom, into the best pew in church, when he am, but the advantages the purchaser of this chain will possess I haven't time to tell. What? No buyers? Why, what's the matter with ye? Have you no money, or no brains? But I'll ruin myself for your sakes. Say nines. For this splendid piece of jewelry, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, a shilling, will anybody give a shilling? Well, here eleven d, ten d, nine d, eight d, seven d, six one half d, six d. Is there ever a buyer at sixpence? Now I'll ask no more and I'll take no less, sell it or never sell it. The concluding words are spoken with peculiar emphasis, and after saying them the cheap John never takes any lower sum. A customer perhaps is soon obtained for the guard chain, and then the vendor elevates his voice, sold to a very respectable gentleman, with his mouth between his nose and chin, a most remarkable circumstance. I believe I've just one more, this is better than the last, I must have a shilling for this. Sixpence. To you, sir. Sold again, to a gentleman worth thirty zero 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 l. A year, only the right owner keeps him out of it. I believe I've just one more. Yes, here it is, it's brighter, longer, stronger, and betterer than the last. I must have at least ten pence for this. Well then, nine, eight, seven, six, take this one for a sixpence. Sold again, to a gentleman, his father's pet and his mother's joy. Pray, sir, does your mother know you're out? Well, I don't think I've any more, but I'll look, yes, here is one more. Now this is better than all the rest. Sold again, to a most respectable gentleman, whose mother keeps a chandler's shop, and whose father turns the mangle. In this manner the cheap John continues to sell his guard chain, until he has drained his last customer for that particular commodity. He has always his remark to make relative to the purchaser. The cheap John always takes care to receive payment before he hazards his jokes, which I need scarcely remark are ready-made, and most of them ancient and worn threadbare, the joint property of the whole fraternity of cheap Johns. After supplying his audience with one particular article, he introduces another, here is a carving knife and fork, none of your wasters, capital buckhorn handle, manufactured of the best steel, in a regular workmanlike manner. Fit for carving in the best style, from a sparrow to a bullock. I don't ask sevens. Six D, for this, although go over to Mr., the ironmonger, and he will have the impudence to ask you fifteenths. For a worse article. The cheap Johns always make comparisons as to their own prices and the shopkeepers, and sometimes mention their names. I say fives. For the carving knife and fork. Why, it's an article that'll almost fill your children's bellies by looking at it, and will always make one pound, of beef go as far as six pounds carved by any other knife and fork. Well, fours, threes, twos, ones. Eleven d, ones. Ten d, ones. Nine d, ones. Eight d, ones. Seven d, 18d. I ask no more, nor I'll take no less. The salesman throughout his variety of articles indulges in the same jokes, and holds out the same inducements. I give a few. This is the original teapot, producing one, formerly invented by the Chinese. The first that ever was imported by those celebrated people, only two of them came over in three ships. If I do not sell this today, I intend presenting it to the British Museum or the Great Exhibition. It is mostly used for making tea, sometimes by ladies, for keeping a little drop on the sly. It is an article constructed upon scientific principles, considered to require a lesser quantity of tea to manufacture the largest quantity of tea water than any other teapot now in use, largely patronized by the teetotalers. Now, here's a fine pair of bellows. Any of you want to raise the wind? This is a capital opportunity, if you'll try. I'll tell you how, buy these of me for threes. 
6 d, and go and pawn them for sevens. Will you buy him, sir? No. Well, then, you be blowed. Let's see, I said threes. 6 d, it's too little, but as I have said it, they must go, well, threes, and k. And k. Capital article to chastise the children or a drunken husband. Well, take M for one's dot, I ask no more, and I'll take no less. These men have several articles which they sell singly, such as tea trays, copper kettles, fire irons, guns, whips, to all of which they have some preamble. But their most attractive lot is a heap of miscellaneous articles, I have here a pair of scissors, I only want half a crown for them. What? You won't give ones. Well, I'll add something else. Here's a most useful article, a knife with eight blades, and there's not a blade among you all that's more highly polished. This knife's a case of instruments in addition to the blades, here's a corkscrew, a button hook, a file, and a picker. For this capital knife and first-rate pair of scissors I ask ones. Well, well, you've no more conscience than a lawyer, here's something else, a pocketbook. This book no gentleman should be without. It contains a diary for every day in the week, an almanac, a ready reckoner, a tablet for your own memorandums, pockets to keep your papers, and a splendid pencil with a silver top. No buyers. I'm astonished, but I'll add another article. Here's a pocket comb. No young man with any sense of decency should be without a pocket comb. What looks worse than to see a man's head in an uproar? Some of you look as if your hair hadn't seen a comb for years. Surely I shall get a customer now. What? No buyers, well I never. Here, I'll add half a dozen of the very best Britannia metal teaspoons, and if you don't buy, you must be spoons yourselves. Why, you perfectly astonish me. I really believe if I was to offer all in the shop, myself included, I should not draw ones. Out of you. Well, I'll try again. Here, I'll add a dozen of black lead pencils. Now, then, look at these articles, he spreads them out, holding them between his fingers to the best advantage, here's a pair of first-rate scissors, that will almost cut of themselves, this valuable knife. Which comprises within itself almost a chest of tools, a splendid pocketbook, which must add to the respectability and consequence of any man who wears it, a pocket comb which possesses the peculiar property of making the hair curl. And dyeing it any color you wish, a half dozen spoons, nothing inferior to silver, and that do not require half the usual quantity of sugar to sweeten your tea, and a dozen beautiful pencils, at least worth the money I ask for the whole lot. Now, a reasonable price for these articles would be at least tens. 6d. I'll sell them for ones. I ask no more, I'll take no less. Sold again. The opposition these men display to each other, while pursuing their business, is mostly assumed, for the purpose of attracting a crowd. Sometimes, when in earnest, their language is disgusting. And I have seen them, says an informant, after selling, try and settle their differences with a game at fisticuffs, but this occurred but seldom. One of these men had a wife who used to sell for him, she was considered to be the best, chaffer, on the road, not one of them could stand against her tongue, but her language abounded with obscenity. All the, cheap Johns, were afraid of her. They never undersell each other, unless they get in a real passion, this but seldom happens, but when it does they are exceedingly bitter against each other. I cannot state the language they use, further than that it reaches the very summit of blackguardism. They have, however, assumed quarrels, for the purpose of holding a crowd together, and chaff goes round, intended to amuse their expected customers. He's coming your way tomorrow, they'll say one of the other, mind and don't hang your husband's shirts to dry, ladies, he's very lucky at finding things before they're lost. He sells very cheap, no doubt, but mind, if you handle any of his wares, he don't make you a present of a scotch fiddle for nothing. His hair looks as if it had been cut with a knife and fork. The Irishmen, in these displays, generally have the best of it. Indeed, most of their jokes have originated with the Irishmen, 
who complain of the piracies of other, cheap Johns, for as soon as the joke is uttered it is the property of the Commonwealth. And not unfrequently used against the inventor half an hour after its first appearance. A few of them are not over particular as to the respectability of their transactions. I recollect one purchasing a brick at Sheffield. The brick was packed up in paper, with a knife tied on the outside, it appeared like a package of knives, containing several dozens. The cheap John made out that he bought them as stolen property, the biter was deservedly bitten. A few of the fraternity are well known fences, and some of them pursue the double calling of cheap John and gambler, keeping gambling tables at races. However, the majority are hard working men, who unite untiring industry with the most indomitable perseverance, for the laudable purpose of bettering their condition. I believe the most successful in the line have worked their way up from nothing, gaining experience as they proceeded. I have known two or three start the trade with plenty of stock, but, wanting the tact, they have soon been knocked off the road. There is a great deal of judgment required in knowing the best fares, and even when there, as to getting a good stand, and these matters are to be acquired only by practice. In the provinces, and in Scotland, there may be one hundred cheap johns, or, as they term themselves, Hansellers. They are generally a most persevering body of men, and have frequently risen from small hawkers of belts, braces, and k. Their receipts are from 5 l. to 30 l. per day, their profits from 20 to 25 per cent, 20 l. is considered a good day's work, and they can take about three fares a week during the summer months. I have known many of these men, a man well acquainted with them informs me, who would walk twenty miles to a fair during the night, hawk the public houses the whole of the day, and start again all night for a fair to be held twenty miles off upon the following day. I knew two Irish lads, named, and I watched their progress with some interest. Each had a stock of goods worth a few shillings. And now each has a wholesale warehouse, one at Sheffield, in the cutlery line, and the other at Birmingham, in general wares. The goods the Han seller disposes of are mostly purchased at Sheffield and Birmingham. They purchase the cheapest goods they can obtain. Many of the Han sellers have settled in various parts of England as swag shopkeepers. There are two or three in London, I am told, who have done so. One in the Kent Road, a large concern, the others I am not aware of their locality. Their mode of living while traveling is rather peculiar. Those who have their caravans, sleep in them, some with their wives and families. They have a man, or more generally a boy, to look after the horse, and other drudgery, and sometimes at a fair, to hawk, or act as a button, a decoy, to purchase the first lot of goods put up. This boy is accommodated with a bed made between the wheels of the cart or wagon, with some old canvas hung round to keep the weather out, not the most comfortable quarters, perhaps, but, as they say, it's nothing when you're used to it. The packing up occurs when there's no more chance of affecting sales, the horse is put to, and the caravan proceeds on the road towards the next town intended to visit. After a sufficient day's travel, the cheap John looks out for a spot to encamp for the night. A clear stream of water, and provender for the horse, are indispensable. Or perhaps the Han seller has visited that part before, and is aware of the halting place. After having released the horse, and secured his four feet, so that he cannot stray, the next process is to look for some crack, some dry wood to light a fire, this is the boy's work. He is told not to despoil hedges, or damage fences, cheap John, doesn't wish to offend the farmers. And during his temporary sojourn in the green lanes, he frequently has some friendly chat with the yeomen and their servants, sometimes disposes of goods, and often barters for a piece of fat bacon or potatoes. A fire is lighted between the shafts of the cart, a stick placed across, upon which is suspended the cookery utensil. When the meal is concluded, the parties retire to bed, the master within the caravan, and the boy to his chamber between the wheels. Sometimes they breakfast before they proceed on their journey, at other times they travel a few miles first. Those who have children bring them up in such a manner as may be imagined considering their itinerant life, but there are very few who have families traveling with them, though in most cases a wife. 
generally the children of the cheap John are stationary, either out at nurse or with relatives. Some of the cheap Johns have wagons upon four wheels, others have carts, but both are fitted up with a wooden roof. The proprietor invariably sleeps within his portable house, both for the protection of his property and also upon the score of economy. The vans with four wheels answer all the purposes of a habitation. The furniture consists of a bed placed upon boxes, containing the stock in trade. The bed extends the whole width of the vehicle, about 6 feet 6 inches, and many generally extend about 5 feet. Into the body of the van, and occupies the farthest end of the machine from the door, which door opens out upon the horse. The four-wheeled vans are 12 feet long, and the two-wheeled carts 9 feet. During business hours the whole of the articles most likely to be wanted are spread out upon the bed, and the assistant, either the wife or a boy, hands them out as the salesman may require them. The furniture, in addition to the bed, is very scarce, indeed they are very much averse to carry more than is really necessary. The pail, the horse takes his corn and beans from, I don't know why, but they never use nose bags, serves the purpose of a wash-hand basin or a washing tub. It is generally painted the same color as the van, with the initials of the proprietor painted upon it, and, when traveling, hangs upon a hook under the machine. They mostly begin with a two-wheeled machine, and if successful a four-wheeler follows. The tables and chairs are the boxes in which the goods are packed. A tea kettle and saucepan, and as few Delph articles as possible, and corner cupboard, and these comprise the whole of the furniture of the van. In the four-wheeled wagons there is always a fireplace similar to those the captains of ships have in their cabins, but in the two-wheeled carts fireplaces are dispensed with. These are mostly brass ones, and are kept very bright. For the cheap johns, are proud of their van and its contents. They are always gaudily painted, sometimes expensively, indeed they are most expensive articles, and cost from 80L. To 120L. The principal person for making these machines is a Mr. Davidson of Leeds. The showman's caravans are still more expensive, the last purchased by the late Mr. Wumwell cost more than 300 L, and is really a curiosity. He termed it, as all showmen do, the living wagon, viz. To live in, it has parlor and kitchen, and is fitted up most handsomely, its exterior presents the appearance of a first-class railway carriage. The front exterior of the van during the trading operations of the cheap johns is hung round with guns, saws, tea trays, bridles, whips, center bits, and other articles displayed to the best advantage. The name of the proprietor is always prominently displayed along the whole side of the vehicle, added to which is a signification that he is a wholesale hardware man from Sheffield, Yorkshire, or Birmingham, Warwickshire. And sometimes an extra announcement. The original cheap John. I do not know any class of men who are more fond of the good things of this life than cheap John. His dinner, during a fair, is generally eaten upon the platform outside his van, where he disposes of his wares, and invariably consists of a joint of baked meat and potatoes, that is where they can get a dinner baked. As little time as possible is occupied in eating, especially if trade is good. At a hill fair, that is where the fair is held upon a hill away from a town, a fire is made behind the cart, the pot is suspended upon three sticks, and dinner prepared in the usual camp fashion. The wife or boy superintends this. Tea and coffee also generally find their way to their table, and if there's no cold meat a plentiful supply of bacon, beefsteaks, eggs, or something in the shape of a relish, seem to be with cheap John indispensable. His man or boy, if John is unmarried, appears to be upon an equality with the master in the eating department, he is not allowanced, neither has he to wait until his superior has finished. Get it over as quick as you can seems to be the chief object. Perhaps from the circumstance of their selling guns, and consequently always having such implements in their possession, these men, when they have time on their hands, are fond of the sports of the field. And many a hare finds its way into the camp kettle of cheap John. I need not say that they practice this sport with but little respectful feeling towards the game laws, but they are careful when indulging in such amusement, and I never heard of one getting into a hobble. 
During the winter, since the cheap John has been obliged to become a licensed auctioneer, some of them take shops and sell their goods by auction or get up mock auctions. I have been told by them that sometimes it's a better game than pawn selling. The commencement of the cheap John's season is at Lynn in Norfolk, there is a mark there commencing February 14th, it continues 14 days. After this, there is Wisp Beach, Spalding, Grantham, and other marts in Norfolk and Lincolnshire, which bring them up to Easter. At Easter there are many fairs, Manchester, Knott Mill, Blackburn, Darlington, Newcastle, and K, and K. The cheap Johns then disperse themselves through different parts of the country. Hill fairs are considered the best, that is cattle fairs, where there are plenty of farmers and country people. Hirings for servants are next to them. It may appear curious, but Sheffield and Birmingham fairs are two of the best for the cheap John's business in England. There are two fairs at each place during the year. Sheffield, at Whitsuntide and November. Birmingham, Whitsuntide and September. Nottingham, Derby, Leeds, Newcastle, Bristol, Glasgow, in fact, where the greatest population is, the chances for business are considered the best, and if I may judge from the number of traders in this line, who attend the largest towns. I should say they succeed better than in smaller towns. If we calculate that there are 100 cheap johns in London and in the country, and they are more or less itinerant, and that they each take 4 L. per day for 9 months in the year, or 24 L. per week, this amounts to 2 400 L. per week, or about 90 000 L. in 9 months. Supposing their profits to be 20%, it would leave 18 000 L. clear income. Say that during the winter there are 75 following the business, and that their receipts amount to 15 L. each per week, this amounts to 13 500 L. additional, and, at the rate of 20%, profit, comes to 2, 700 L, making throughout the year the profits of the 100 cheap johns, 20, 700 L, or 207 L. A man. The cheap johns seldom frequent the crowded thoroughfares of London. Their usual pitches in the metropolis are, King's Cross, St. George's in the East, Stepney, round about the London docks, Paddington, Kennington, and such like places. The crippled street seller of nutmeg graders. I now give an example of one of the classes driven to the streets by utter inability to labor. I have already spoken of the sterling independence of some of these men possessing the strongest claims to our sympathy and charity, and yet preferring to sell rather than beg. As I said before, many ingrained beggars certainly use the street trade as a cloak for alms seeking, but as certainly many more, with every title to our assistance, use it as a means of redemption from beggary. That the nutmeg grater seller is a noble example of the latter class, I have not the least doubt. I have made all due inquiries to satisfy myself as to his worthiness, and I feel convinced that when the reader looks at the portrait here given, and observes how utterly helpless the poor fellow is, and then reads the following plain unvarnished tale, he will marvel like me, not only at the fortitude which could sustain him under all his heavy afflictions, but at the resignation, not to say philosophy, with which he bears them every one. His struggles to earn his own living, notwithstanding his physical incapacity even to put the victuals to his mouth after he has earned them, are instances of a nobility of pride that are I believe without a parallel. The poor creature's legs and arms are completely withered, indeed he is scarcely more than head and trunk. His thigh is hardly thicker than a child's wrist. His hands are bent inward from contraction of the sinews, the fingers being curled up and almost as thin as the claws of a bird's foot. He is unable even to stand, and cannot move from place to place but on his knees, which are shod with leather caps, like the heels of a clog, strapped round the joint. The soles of his boots are on the upper leathers, that being the part always turned towards the ground while he is crawling along. His countenance is rather handsome than otherwise. The intelligence indicated by his ample forehead is fully borne out by the testimony as to his sagacity in his business, and the mild expression of his eye by the statements as to his feeling for all others in affliction. I sell nutmeg graters and funnels, said the cripple to me, I sell them at 1d. 
and one one half d. A piece. I get mine of the man in whose house I live. He is a tinman, and makes for the street trade and shops and all. I pay seven d. A dozen for them, and I get twelve d. Or eighteen d. A dozen, if I can when I sell them, but I mostly get only a penny a piece, it's quite a chance if I have a customer at one one half d. Some days I sell only three, some days not one, though I'm out from ten o'clock till six. The most I ever took was threes. Six d in a day. Some weeks I hardly clear my expenses, and they're between sevens. And eights. A week. For not being able to dress and undress myself, I'm obligated to pay someone to do it for me, I think I don't clear more than sevens. A week take one week with another. When I don't make that much, I go without, sometimes friends who are kind to me give me a trifle, or else I should starve. As near as I can judge, I take about fifteenths. A week, and out of that I clear about a success. Or sevens. I pay for my meals as I have them, 3d. Or 4d. A meal. I pay every night for my lodging as I go in, if I can, but if not my landlady lets it run a night or two. I give her ones. A week for my washing and looking after me, and ones. 6d for my lodging. When I do very well I have three meals a day, but it's oftener only two, breakfast and supper, unless of Sunday. On a wet day when I can't get out, I often go without food. I may have a bit of bread and butter give me, but that's all, then I lie a bed. I feel miserable enough when I see the rain come down of a weekday, I can tell you. Ah, it is very miserable indeed lying in bed all day, and in a lonely room, without perhaps a person to come near one, helpless as I am, and hear the rain beat against the windows, and all that without nothing to put in your lips. I've done that over and over again where I lived before, but where I am now I'm more comfortable like. My breakfast is mostly bread and butter and tea, and my supper, bread and butter and tea with a bit of fish, or a small bit of meat. What my landlord and landlady has I share with them. I never break my fast from the time I go out in the morning till I come home, unless it is a halfpenny orange I buy in the street, I do that when I feel faint. I have only been selling in the streets since this last winter. I was in the workhouse with a fever all the summer. I was destitute afterwards, and obliged to begin selling in the streets. The guardians gave me fives. To get stock. I had always dealt in tinware, so I knew where to go to buy my things. It's very hard work indeed is street selling for such as me. I can't walk no distance. I suffer a great deal of pains in my back and knees. Sometimes I go in a barrow, when I'm traveling any great way. When I go only a short way I crawl along on my knees and toes. The most I've ever crawled is two miles. When I get home afterwards, I'm in great pain. My knees swell dreadfully, and they're all covered with blisters, and my toes ache awful. I've corns all on top of them. The street seller of nutmeg graters. From a daguerreotype by beard. Often after I've been walking, my limbs and back ache so badly that I can get no sleep. Across my lines it feels as if I'd got some great weight, and my knees are in a heat, and throb, and feel as if a knife was running into them. When I go upstairs I have to crawl upon the back of my hands and my knees. I can't lift nothing to my mouth. The sinews of my hands is all contracted. I am obliged to have things held to my lip for me to drink, like a child. I can use a knife and fork by leaning my arm on the table and then stooping my head to it. I can't wash nor undress myself. Sometimes I think of my helplessness a great deal. The thoughts of it used to throw me into fits at one time, very bad. It's the Almighty's will that I am so, and I must abide by it. People says, as they passes me in the streets, poor fellow, it's a shocking thing, but very seldom they does any more than pity me. Some lays out a halfpenny or a penny with me, but the most of them goes on about their business. Persons looks at me a good bit when I go into a strange place. I do feel it very much, 
that I haven't the power to get my living or to do a thing for myself, but I never begged for nothing. I'd sooner starve than I'd do that. I never thought that people whom God had given the power to help themselves ought to help me. I have thought that I'm as I am, obliged to go on my hands and knees, from no fault of my own. Often I've done that, and I've over and over again laid in bed and wondered why the Almighty should send me into the world in such a state, often I've done that on a wet day, with nothing to eat, and no friend to come in me. When I've gone along the streets, too, and been in pain, I've thought, as I've seen the people pass straight up, with all the use of their limbs, and some of them the biggest blackguards, cussing and swearing, I've thought. Why should I be deprived of the use of mine? And I've felt angry like, and perhaps at that moment I couldn't bring my mind to believe the Almighty was so good and merciful as I'd heard say. But then in a minute or two afterwards I've prayed to Him to make me better and happier in the next world. I've always been led to think He's afflicted me as He has for some wise purpose or another that I can't see. I think as mine is so hard a life in this world, I shall be better off in the next. Often when I couldn't afford to pay a boy, I've not had my boots off for four or five nights and days, nor my clothes neither. Give me the world I couldn't take them off myself, and then my feet has swollen to that degree that I've been nearly mad with pain, and I've been shivering and faint, but still I was obliged to go out with my things. If I hadn't I should have starved. Such as I am can't afford to be ill, it's only rich folks as can lay up, not we, for us to take to our beds is to go without food altogether. When I was without never a boy, I used to tie the wet towel round the back of one of the chairs, and wash myself by rubbing my face up against it. I've been two days without a bit of anything passing between my lips. I couldn't go and beg for vittles, I'd rather go without. Then I used to feel faint, and my head used to ache dreadful. I used then to drink a plenty of water. The women's sex is mostly more kinder to me than the men. Some of the men fancies, as I goes along, that I can walk. They often says to me, why, the sole of your boot is as muddy as mine. And one on them is, because I always rests myself on that foot, the other sole, you see, is as clean as when it was first made. The women never seem frightened on me. My trade is to sell brooms and brushes, and all kinds of cutlery and tinware. I learnt it myself. I never was brought up to nothing, because I couldn't use my hands. Mother was a cook in a nobleman's family when I were born. They say as I was a love child. I was not brought up by mother, but by one of her fellow servants. Mother's intellects was so weak, that she couldn't have me with her. She used to fret a great deal about me, so her fellow servant took me when she got married. After I were born, mother married a farmer in middling circumstances. They tell me as my mother was frightened afore I was born. I never knew my father. He went over to Buenos Aires, and kept an hotel there, I've heard mother say as much. No mother couldn't love a child more than mine did me, but her feelings was such she couldn't bear to see me. I never went to mother's to live, but was brought up by the fellow servant as I've told you of. Mother allowed her thirty l. A year. I was with her till two years back. She was always very kind to me, treated me like one of her own. Mother used to come and see me about once a year, sometimes not so often, she was very kind to me then. Oh, yes, I used to like to see her very much. Whatever I wished for she'd let me have, if I wrote to her, she always sent me what I wanted. I was very comfortably then. Mother died four years ago, and when I lost her I fell into a fit, I was told of it all of a sudden. She and the party as I was brought up with was the only friends as I had in the world, the only persons as cared anything about a creature like me. I was in a fit for hours, and when I came to, I thought what would become of me, I knew I could do nothing for myself, and the only friend as I had as could keep me was gone. The person as brought me up was very good, and said, while she'd got a home I should never want, but, two years after mother's death, she was seized with the cholera, and then I hadn't a friend left in the world. When she died I felt ready to kill myself, I was all alone then, and what could I do, cripple as I was. She thought her sons and daughters as I'd been brought up with, like brothers and sisters, 
would look after me. But it was not in their power, they was only hard-working people. My mother used to allow so much a year for my schooling, and I can read and write pretty well. He wrote his name in my presence kneeling at the table. Holding the pen almost as one might fancy a bird would, and placing the paper sideways instead of straight before him. While mother was alive, I was always foraging about to learn something unbeknown to her. I wanted to do so, in case mother should leave me without the means of getting a living. I used to buy old bedsteads, and take them to a man, and get him to repair them, and then I'd put the sacking on myself. I can hold a hammer somehow in my right hand. I used to polish them on my knees. I made a bench to my height out of two old chairs. I used to know what I should get for the bedsteads, and so could tell what I could afford to give the man to do up the parts as I couldn't manage. It was so I got to learn something like a business for myself. When the person died as had brought me up, I could do a little, I had then got the means. Before her death I had opened a kind of shop for things in the general line. I sold tinware, and brasswork, and candlesticks, and fire irons, and all old furniture, and gown prints as well. I went into the tally business, and that ruined me altogether. I couldn't get my money in, there's a good deal owing to me now. Me and a boy used to manage the whole. I used to make all my account books and everything. My lodgers didn't pay me my rent, so I had to move from the house, and live on what stock I had. In my new lodging I went on as well as I could for a little while, but about eighteen months ago I could hold on no longer. Then I borrowed a little, and went hawking tinware and brushes in the country. I sold baking dishes, Dutch ovens, roasting jacks, skewers and gridirons, teapots and saucepans, and combs. I used to exchange sometimes for old clothes. I had a barrow and a boy with me, I used to keep him, and give him ones. A week. I managed to get just a living that way. When the winter came on I gave it up, it was too cold. After that I was took bad with a fever. My stock had been all gone a little while before, and the boy had left because I couldn't keep him, and I had to do all for myself. All my friends was dead, and I had no one to help me, so I was obligated to lay about all night in my things, for I couldn't get them off alone, and that and want of food brought on a fever. Then I was took into the workhouse, and there I stopped all the summer, as I told you. I can't say they treated me bad, but they certainly didn't use me well. If I could have worked after I got better, I could have had tea. But, cause I couldn't do nothing, they gave me that beastly gruel morning and night. I had meat three times a week. They would have kept me there till now, but I would die in the streets rather than be a pauper. So I told them, if they would give me the means of getting a stock, I would try and get a living for myself. After refusing many times to let me have tens, they agreed to give me fives. Then I came out, but I had no home, and so I crawled about till I met with the people where I am now, and they let me sit up there till I got a room of my own. Then some of my friends collected for me about fifteenths. Altogether, and I did pretty well for a little while. I went to live close by the Blackfriars Road, but the people where I lodged treated me very bad. There was a number of girls of the town in the same street, but they was too fond of their selves and their drink to give nothing. They used to buy things of me and never pay me. They never made game of me, nor played me any tricks, and if they saw the boys doing it they would protect me. They never offered to give me no vittles, indeed, I shouldn't have liked to have eaten the food they got. After that I couldn't pay my lodgings, and the parties where I lodged turned me out, and I had to crawl about the streets for four days and nights. This was only a month back. I was fit to die with pain all that time. If I could get a penny I used to go into a coffee shop for half a pint of coffee, and sit there till they drove me out, and then I'd crawl about till it was time for me to go out selling. Oh! Dreadful, dreadful, it was to be all them hours, day and night, on my knees. I couldn't get along at all, I was forced to sit down every minute, and then I used to fall asleep with my things in my hand, and be woke up by the police to be pushed about and druv on by them. It seemed like as if I was walking on the bare bones of my knees. The pain in them was like the cramp, only much worse. 
At last I could bear it no longer, so I went afore Mr. Secker, the magistrate, at Union Hall, and told him I was destitute, and that the parties where I had been living kept my bed and the few things I had, for twos. Sixty, rent, that I owed them. He said he couldn't believe that anybody would force me to crawl about the streets, for four days and nights, cripple as I was, for such a sum. One of the officers told him I was a honest and striving man, and the magistrate sent the officer, with the money, to get my things, but the landlady wouldn't give them till the officer compelled her. And then she chucked my bed out into the middle of the street. A neighbor took it in for me and took care of it till I found out the tinman who had before let me sit up in his house. I should have gone to him at first, but he lived farther than I could walk. I am stopping with him now, and he is very kind to me. I have still some relations living, and they are well to do, but, being a cripple, they despise me. My aunt, my mother's sister, is married to a builder, in Petersham, near Richmond, and they are rich people, having some houses of their own besides a good business. I have got a boy to wheel me down on a barrow to them, and asked assistance of them, but they will have nothing to do with me. They won't look at me for my affliction. Six months ago they gave me half a crown. I had no lodgings nor victuals then. And that I shouldn't have had from them had I not said I was starving and must go to the parish. This winter I went to them, and they shut the door in my face. After leaving my aunts, I went down to Ham Common, where my father-in-law lives, and there his daughter's husband sent for a policeman to drive me away from the place. I told the husband I had no money nor food. But he advised me to go begging, and said I shouldn't have a penny of them. My father-in-law was ill upstairs at the time, but I don't think he would have treated me a bit better, and all this they do because the Almighty has made me a cripple. I can, indeed, solemnly say, that there is nothing else against me, and that I strive hard and crawl about till my limbs ache enough to drive me mad, to get an honest livelihood. With a couple of pounds I could, I think, manage to shift very well for myself. I'd get a stock, and go into the country with a barrow, and buy old metal, and exchange tinware for old clothes, and, with that, I'm almost sure I could get a decent living. I'm accounted a very good dealer. In answer to my inquiries concerning the character of this man, I received the following written communication. I have known C. A. twelve years, the last six years he has dealt with me for tinware. I have found him honest in all his dealings with me, sober and industrious. C. H. Tinman. From the writer of the above testimonial I received the following account of the poor cripple. He is a man of generous a disposition, and very sensitive for the afflictions of others. One day while passing down the borough he saw a man afflicted with St. Vitus's dance shaking from head to foot, and leaning on the arm of a woman who appeared to be his wife. The cripple told my informant that he should never forget what he felt when he beheld that poor man. I thought, he said, what a blessing it is I am not like him. Nor is the cripple, I am told, less independent than he is generous. In all his sufferings and privations he never pleads poverty to others, but bears up under the trials of life with the greatest patience and fortitude. When in better circumstances he was more independent than at present, having since, through illness and poverty, been much humbled. His privations have been great, adds my informant. Only two months back, being in a state of utter destitution and quite worn out with fatigue, he called at the house of a person, where my informant occupied a room, about ten o'clock at night, and begged them to let him rest himself for a short while, but the inhuman landlady and her son laid hold of the wretched man, the one taking him by the arms and the other by the legs, and literally hurled him into the street. The next morning, my informant continued, I saw the poor creature leaning against a lamp post, shivering with the cold, and my heart bled for him, and since that he has been living with me. Of the swag shops of the metropolis. By those who are not connected with the street trade, the proprietors of the swag shops are often called warehousemen, or general dealers, and even slaughterers. These descriptions apply but partially. Warehousemen, or general dealers, are vague terms which I need not further notice. The wretchedly underpaid and overworked shoemakers, cabinet makers, and others call these places slaughterhouses, 
when the establishment is in the hands of tradesmen who buy their goods of poor workmen without having given orders for them. On Saturday afternoons pale-looking men may be seen carrying a few chairs, or bending under the weight of a chiffonier or a chest of drawers, in Tottenham Court Road, and thoroughfares of a similar character in all parts. These are small masters, who make or, as one man said to me, no, sir, I don't make these drawers, I put them together, it can't be called making. It's not workmanship, who, put together, in the hastiest manner, and in any way not positively offensive to the eye, articles of household furniture. The slaughterers, who supply all the goods required for the furniture of a house, buy at starvation prices, the common term, the artificer being often kept waiting for hours, and treated with every indignity. One East End slaughterer, as I ascertained in a former inquiry, used habitually to tell that he prayed for wet Saturday afternoons, because it put twenty L. Extra into his pocket. This was owing to the damage sustained in the appearance of any painted, varnished, or polished article, by exposure to the weather. Or if it had been protected from the weather, by the unwillingness of the small master to carry it to another slaughterhouse in the rain. Under such circumstances, and under most of the circumstances of this unhappy trade, the poor workman is at the mercy of the slaughterer. I describe this matter more fully than I might have deemed necessary, had I not found that both the small masters spoken of, for I called upon some of them again, and the street sellers. Very frequently confounded that the swag shop and that the slaughterhouse. The distinction I hold to be this, the slaughterer buys as a rule, with hardly an exception, the furniture, or whatever it may be, made for the express purpose of being offered to him on speculation of sale. The swag shopkeeper orders his goods as a rule, and buys, as an exception, in the manner in which the slaughterer buys ordinarily. The slaughterer sells by retail, the swag shopkeeper only by wholesale. Most of the articles, of the class of which I now treat, are, brummagem made. An experienced tradesman said to me, all these low-priced metal things, fancy goods and all, which you see about, are made in Birmingham. In nineteen cases out of twenty at the least. They may be marked London, or Sheffield, or Paris, or any place, you can have them marked North Pole if you will, but they're genuine Birmingham. The carriage is lower from Birmingham than from Sheffield, that's one thing. The majority of the swag shop proprietors are Jews. The wares which they supply to the cheap shops, the cheap johns, and the street sellers, in town and country, consist of every variety of article, apart from what is eatable, drinkable, or wearable. In which the trade class I have specified can deal. As regards what is wearable, indeed, such things as braces, garters, and form a portion of the stock of the swag shop. In one street, a thoroughfare at the east end of London, are twenty-three of these establishments. In the windows there is little attempt at display. The design aimed at seems to be rather to crowd the window, as if to show the amplitude of the stores within. The wonderful resources of this most extensive and universal establishment, than to tempt purchasers by exhibiting tastefully what may have been tastefully executed by the artificer, or what it is desired should be held to be so executed. In one of these windows the daylight is almost precluded from the interior by what may be called a perfect wall of pots. A street seller who accompanied me called them merely pots, the trade term, but they were all pot ornaments. Among them were great store of shepherdesses, of greyhounds of a gamboge color, of what I heard called figures, allegorical nymphs with and without birds or wreaths in their hands. Very tall-looking Shakespeare's, I did not see one of these windows without its Shakespeare, a sitting figure, and some pots which seemed to be either shepherds or musicians. From what I could learn, at the pleasure of the seller, the buyer, or the inquirer. The shepherd, or musician is usually seated under a tree. He wears a light blue coat, and yellow breeches, and his limbs, more than his body, are remarkable for their bulk. To call them merely fat does not sufficiently express their character, and in some pots, they are as short and stumpy as they are bulky. On my asking if the dogs were intended for Italian greyhounds, I was told, no, they are German. I alluded however to the species of the animal represented, my informant to the place of manufacture, 
for the pots were chiefly German. A number of mugs however, with the Crystal Palace very well depicted upon them, were unmistakably English. In another window of the same establishment was a conglomeration of pincushions, shaving brushes, letter stamps, all in bone, cribbage boards and boxes, including a pack of cards, necklaces, and strings of beads. The window of a neighboring swag shop presented, in the light crowding, and in greater confusion, an array of brooches, some in colored glass to imitate rubies, topazes, and some containing portraits, deeply colored, in purple attire, and red cheeks, and some being very large cameos, timepieces, with and without glasses, French toys with movable figures, telescopes, American clocks, musical boxes, shirt studs, backgammon boards, tea trays, one with a nondescript bird of most gorgeous green plumage forming a sort of centerpiece, razor strops writing desks, sailors' knives, hairbrushes, and tobacco boxes. Another window presented even a more miscellaneous assortment. Dirks, apparently not very formidable weapons, a mess of steel pens, in brown paper packages and cases, and of black lead pencils, pipe heads, cigar cases, snuff boxes, razors, shaving brushes, letter stamps, metal teapots, metal teaspoons. Glass globes with artificial flowers and leaves within the glass, an improvement one man thought on the old ornament of a reel in a bottle, peel medals, exhibition medals, roulette boxes, scent bottles. Quill pens with artificial flowers in the feathery part, fans, side combs, glass penholders, and pot figures, caricatures, of Louis Philippe, carrying a very red umbrella, Marshal Haino, with some instrument of torture in his hand. While over all boomed a huge English seaman, in yellow waistcoat and with a brick-colored face. Sometimes the furniture of a swag shop window is less plentiful, but quite as heterogeneous. In one were only American clocks, French toys, large, opera glasses, knives and forks, and powder flasks. In some windows the predominant character is jewelry. Eardrops, generally gilt, rings of all kinds, brooches of every size and shade of colored glass, shawl pins, shirt studs, necklaces, bead purses, small paintings of the Crystal Palace, in burnished gold frames, watch guards. Watch seals, each with three impressions or mottos, watch chains and keys, silver toothpicks, medals, and snuff boxes. It might be expected that the jewelry shops would present the most imposing display of any. They are, on the contrary, among the dingiest, as if it were not worth the trouble to put clean things in the window, but merely what sufficed to characterize the nature of the trade carried on. Of the twenty-three swag shops in question, five were confined to the trade in all the branches of stationery. Of these I saw one, the large window of which was perfectly packed from bottom to top with note paper, account and copy books, steel pens, pencils, sealing wax, enameled wafers, in boxes, ink stands, and of the other shops, two had cases of watches, with no attempt at display, or even arrangement. Poor things, I was told by a person familiar with the trade in them, fit only to offer to countrymen when they've been drinking at a fair, and think themselves clever. I have so far described the exterior of these street dealers' bazaars, the swag shops, in what may be called their headquarters. Upon entering some of these places of business, spacious rooms are seen to extend behind the shop or warehouse which opens to the street. Some are almost blocked up with what appears a litter of packing cases, packages, and bales, but which are no doubt ordered systematically enough, while the shelves are crammed with goods in brown paper, or in cases or boxes. This uniformity of package, so to speak, has the effect of destroying the true character of these swag storerooms. For they present the appearance of only three or four different kinds of merchandise being deposited on a range of shelves, when, perhaps, there are a hundred. In some of these swag shops it appears certain, both from what fell under my own observation, and from what I learned through my inquiries of persons long familiar with such places. That the litter I have spoken of is disposed so as to present the appearance of an affluence of goods without the reality of possession. In no warehouses, properly, swag, or wholesale traders, is there any arranged display of the wares vended. The don't vant people here, 
one street seller had often heard a swag shopkeeper say, as looks about them, and says, I'll putty. VOT nice things. V vance to sell, and not to show. VE is all for business, and BD, D. All of these places which I saw were dark, more or less so, in the interior, as if a customer's inspection were uncared for. Some of the swag shop people present cards, or circulars with prices, to their street and other customers, calling attention to the variety of their wares. These circulars are not given without inquiry, as if it were felt that one must not be wasted. On one I find the following enumeration. Shopkeepers and dealers supplied with the following articles. Clocks, American, French, German, and English eight-day dials. Watches, gold and silver. Musical boxes, two, four, six, and eight airs. Watch glasses, common flint, Geneva, and lunettes. Main springs, blue and straw color, English and Geneva. Watch materials, of every description. Jewelry, a general assortment. Spectacles, gold, silver, steel, horn, and metal frames, concave, convex, colored, and smoked eyes. Telescopes, one, two, and three draws. Mathematical instruments. Combs, side, dressing, curl, pocket, ivory, small tooth, and k. Musical instruments, violins, violoncellos, bows, and k, flutes, clarionets, trombones, ophoclides, cornopeans, French horns, post horns, trumpets, and passes, violin tailboards, pegs, and bridges. Accordions, French and German of every size and style. It must not be thought that swag shops are mainly repositories of fancy articles, for such is not the case. I have described only the windows and outward appearances of these places, the interior being little demonstrative of the business. But the bulkier and more useful articles of swag traffic cannot be exposed in a window. In the miscellaneous or Birmingham and Sheffield shops, however, the useful and the fancy are mixed together. As is shown by the following extracts from the circular of one of the principal swag houses. I give each head, with an occasional statement of prices. The firm describe themselves as wholesale, retail, and export furnishing ironmongers, general hardware men, manufacturers of clocks, watches, and steel pens, and importers of toys, beads, and other foreign manufacturers. Table cutlery. SD. Common knives and forks, per dozen twenty. Ivory handle table knives and fork, per set of fifty, pieces three hundred. Tables, per dozen one fifty. Desserts, per dozen one thirteen. Carvers, per pair forty. Fire irons. Strong wrought iron for kitchens, per set twos. To sixty. Ditto for parlors or libraries, bright pans, fours. 6D to 70. Fenders. Kitchen fenders, 3 feet long, with sliding bar 30. Green ditto, brass tops, for bedrooms 18. Britannia metal goods, teapots, and k, German silver goods, teaspoons, ones. To twos. Per dozen, and k. Bellows. Kitchen, each 10D. To 20. Parlor ditto, brass pipes and nails 2s. 3d to 30. Japan goods, brass goods, iron saucepans, oval iron pots, iron tea kettles, and k, iron stewpans, and k. The prices here run very systematically. 1 quart 12. 3 pints 18. 2 quarts 20. 3 quarts 30. 4 quarts 39. 5 quarts 40. Patent enameled saucepans, oval tin boilers, tin saucepans, tea kettles, coffee pots. In all these useful articles the prices range in the same way as in the iron stewpans. Copper goods, kettles, coal scoops, and k. Tin fish kettles, dish covers, rosewood work boxes, glass, brushes, tooth, hair, clothes, scrubbing, stove, shoe, Japan hearth, banister, plate, 
carpet, and dandy, tools, plated goods, warranted silver edges, snuffers, beads. Musical instruments, accordions from ones to fives, and k. Then come dials and clocks, combs, optics, spectacles, eyeglasses, telescopes, opera glasses, each 10d. To tens. China ornaments, lamps, sundries, these I give verbatim, to show the nature of the trade, crimping and goffering machines, from fourteenths, looking glasses, pictures, and k. Beads of every kind, watch guards, shaving boxes, guns, pistols, powder flasks, belts, percussion caps, and k, corkscrews, 6d. To twos, nut cracks, 6d. To ones. 6d, folding measures, each twos. To fours, silver spoons, haberdashery, skates prepare twos. To tens, carpet bags, each threes. To tens. Egg boilers, tapers, flat and box irons, Italian irons and heaters, earthenware jugs, metal covers, teapots, plated straw baskets, sieves, wood pails, camera obscuras, metals, amulets, perfumery and fancy soaps of all kinds. Mathematical instruments, steel pens, silver and German silver patent pencil cases and leads, snuff boxes, in great variety, strops, ink, slates, metal eyelet holes and machines, padlocks, braces, belts, congreves, lucifers, fusees, pocketbooks. Bill cases, bed keys, and a great variety of articles too numerous to mention. Notwithstanding the specific character and arrangement of the circulars with prices, it is common enough for the swag shop proprietors to intimate to anyone likely to purchase that those prices are not altogether to be a guidance. As 35%. Discount is allowed on the amount of a ready money purchase. One of the largest swags made such an allowance to a street seller last week. The swag shops, of which I state the numbers in a parenthesis, are in Houndsditch, their principal locality, 23, Minories, 4, Whitechapel, 2, Ratcliffe Highway, 20, Shoreditch, 1, Long Lane, Smithfield, 4, Fleet Lane, 2, Hollywell Street. Strand, 1, Tothill Street, 4, Compton Street, Soho, 1, Hatton Garden, 2, Clarkenwell, 10, Kent Street, Borough, 8, Newcut, 6, Blackman Street, 2, Tooley Street, 3, London Road, 3, Borough Road, 1, Waterloo Road, 4, in all 101. But a person who had been upwards of 20 years a frequenter of these places counted up 50 others, many of them in obscure courts and alleys near Houndsditch, Ratcliffe Highway, and k, and k. These outsiders are generally of a smaller class than those I have described, and I can tell you, sir, the same man said, some of them, and some of the big ones, too, are real swag shops still, partly so, that is, you understand me, sir. The word, swag, I should inform my polite readers, means in slang language, plunder. It may be safely calculated, then, that there are 150 swag shops to which the different classes of street sellers resort for the purchase of stock. Among these establishments are pot swag, stationary swag, haberdashery swag, jewelry swag, and miscellaneous swag, the latter comprise far more than half of the entire number. And constitute the warehouses which are described by their owners as Birmingham and Sheffield, or English and Foreign, or English and German. It is in these last mentioned swags that the class I now treat of, the street sellers of metal manufactures, find the commodities of their trade. To this, however, there is one exception. Tins for household use are not sold at the general swag shops but fancy tins, such as japanned and embellished trays, are vended there extensively. The street sellers of this order are supplied at the tin shops, the number of the wholesale tin men supplying the street sellers is about 50. The principle on which the business is conducted is precisely that of the more general swag shop. But I shall speak of them when I treat of the street sellers of tins. An intelligent man, who had been employed in different capacities in some of the principal swag shops, told me of one which had been carried on by the same family, from father to son, for more than seventy years. 
In the largest of the swags, about 200 hands are employed in the various capacities of salesmen, buyers, clerks, travelers, unpackers, packers, porters, and k, and k. On some mornings 25 large packages, some of small articles entirely, are received from the carriers. In one week, when my informant assisted in making up the books, the receipts were upwards of 3,000 L. In my opinion, sir, he said, and it's from an insight into the business, Mr. S. Profit on that 3,000 L. Was not less than 35%, for he's a great capitalist, and pays for everything down upon the nail, that's more than 1,000 L. Profit in a week. Certainly it was an extra week, and there's the 200 hands to pay, but that wouldn't range higher than 300 L, indeed, not so high. And there's heavy rent and taxes, and rates, no doubt, and he, the proprietor is a Jew, is a fair man to the trade, and not an uncharitable man, but he will drive a good bargain where it's possible. So considering everything, sir, the profits must be very great, and they are mostly made out of poor buyers, who sell it to poor people in the streets or in small shops. It's a wonderful trade. From the best information I could obtain I come to the conclusion that, including small and large shops, 3000 L. Yearly is the average receipt of each, or, as it is most frequently expressed, that sum is, turned over, by the swag shopkeepers yearly. There is great competition in the trade, and much of what is called, cutting, or one tradesman underselling another. The profit consequently varies from 20 to 35 and, rarely, 50%. Sometimes a swag shop proprietor is, hung up, with a stock the demand for which has ceased, and he must dispose of it as, a job lot, to make room for other goods, and thus is necessarily, out of pocket. The smaller swag shops do not, turn over, 500 L. A year. The calculation I have given shows an outlay, yearly, of 450,000 L. At the swag shops of London. But, said a partner in one of these establishments, what proportion of the goods find their way into the streets, what to the shops, what to the country, and what for shipping, I cannot form even a guess. For we never ask a customer for what purpose he wants the goods, though sometimes he will say, I must have what is best for such or such a trade. Say half a million turned over in a year, sir, by the warehousemen who sell to the street people, among others, and you're within the mark. I found the street sellers characterized the swags as hard and grinding men, taking every advantage in the way of trade. There is, too, I was told by a man lately employed in a swag shop a constant collision of clamor and bargaining, not to say of wits, between the smarter street sellers, the pattern class especially, and the swagmen with whom they are familiar. The points in which the, the swag shops resemble the, the slaughterhouses are in the traffic in workboxes, desks, and dressing cases. Of the life of a cheap John. The following narrative, relative to this curious class, who, in many respects, partake of the characteristics which I have pointed out as proper to the mountebank of old, was taken from one of the fraternity. It may be cited as an example of those who are bred to the streets, my father and mother, said he, both followed a traveling occupation, and were engaged in vending different things, from the old brimstone matches up to clothes lines. Clothes props, and clothes pegs. They never got beyond these, the other articles were thread, tapes, nutmeg graters, shoot eyes, stay laces, and needles. My father, my mother used to tell me, was a great scholard, and had not always been a traveling vagrant. My mother had never known any other life. I, however, did not reap any benefit from my father's scholarship. At a very early age, five or six perhaps, I recollect myself a poor little neglected wretch, sent out each day with a roll of matches, with strict injunctions not to come home without selling them, and to bring home a certain sum of money. Upon pain of receiving a sound thrashing, which threat was mostly put into execution whenever I failed to perform the task imposed upon me. My father seldom worked, that is, seldom hawked, but my mother, poor thing, had to travel and work very hard to support four of us, my father, myself, and a sister, who is since dead. I was but little assistance, and sometimes when I did not bring home the sum required, she would make it up, 
and tell my father I had been a good boy. My father was an inveterate drinker, and a very violent temper. My mother, I am sorry to say, used to drink too, but I believe that ill usage drove her to it. They led a dreadful life, I scarcely felt any attachment for them, home we had none, one place was as good another to us. I left my parents when scarcely eight years old. I had received a thrashing the day before for being a defaulter in my sale, and I determined the following morning to decamp. And accordingly, with my nine penny worth of matches, the quantity generally allotted me, I set out to begin the world upon my own account. Although this occurred twenty-five years ago, I have never met my parents since. My father, I heard, died a few years after my leaving, but my mother I know not whether she be living or dead. I left my parents at Dover, and journeyed on to London. I knew there were lodging houses for travellers in every town, some of them I had stopped at with my father and mother. I told the people of these houses that my parents would arrive the following day, and paid my two d. For the share of a third, fourth, fifth, or even sixth part of a bed, according to the number of children who inhabited the lodging house upon that particular night. My matches I could always sell if I tried, but I used to play my time away, and many times night has arrived before I thought of effecting sales sufficient to pay my expenses at the beggar's hotel. Broken victuals I got in abundance, indeed more than sufficient for my own consumption. The money I received for the matches, after paying my lodging, and purchasing a pennyworth of brimstone to make more, the wood I begged at the carpenters, I gambled away at cards. Yes, young as I was, I understood blind hooky. I invariably lost. Of course I was cheated. I remained in a lodging house in Mill Lane, Deptford, for two years, discontinued the match selling, and, having a tidy voice, took to hawking songs through the public houses. The sailors used to ask me to sing, and there were few days that I did not accumulate twos. 6d, and from that to fours, especially when I chose to be industrious, but my love of pitch and toss and blind hooky always kept me poor. I often got into debt with my landlady, and had no difficulty in doing so, for I always felt a pride in paying. From selling the printed songs, I imbibed a wish to learn to read, and, with the assistance of an old soldier, I soon acquired sufficient knowledge to make out the names of each song. And shortly afterwards I could study a song and learn the words without anyone helping me. I stopped in Deptford until I was something more than twelve years old. I had then laid the songs aside, and taken to hawking small wares, tapes, thread, and k, and in the winter season I was a buyer of rabbit and hare skins. I kept at this for about three years, sometimes entirely without a stock. I had run it out, perhaps gambled it away and at such times I suffered great privations. I never could beg. I have often tried, but never could. I have approached a house with a begging intention, knocked at the door, and when it has been opened I have requested a drink of water. When I was about sixteen I joined in partnership with a man who used to make phosphorus boxes. I sold them for him. A piece of phosphorus was stuck in a tin tube, the match was dipped into the phosphorus, and it would ignite by friction. I was hawking these boxes in Norwich, when the constable considered they were dreadful affairs, and calculated to encourage and assist thieves and burglars. He took me before the magistrate, at the Beak's own private house, and he being equally horrified, I was sent to prison for a month. I have often thought since that the proceeding was illegal. What would be said now if a man was to be sent to jail for selling Lucifer matches? In Norwich prison I associated with the rest, and if I had been inclined to turn thief I had plenty of opportunities and offers of gratuitous instruction. The separate or silent system was not in vogue then. I worked on the treadmill. Dinner was allowed to be sent in on the Sunday by the prisoner's friends. My dinner was sent in on the first Sunday by the man I sold the boxes for, as it was on the second, third, and fourth, but I had lost it before I received it. I had always gambled it away, for there were plenty of opportunities of doing so in the prisons then. On leaving the jail I received ones, with this I purchased some songs and travelled to Yarmouth. I could do best among sailors. After a few weeks I had accumulated about eights, 
and with that sum I purchased some hardware at the swag shop, commenced hawking, and cut the vocal department altogether, still I gambled and kept myself in poverty. In the course of time, however, I had amassed a basket of goods, worth, perhaps, 3L. I gambled and lost them all in one night. I was so downcast and unhappy from this circumstance, that it caused me to reflect seriously, and I made an oath that I never would gamble again. I have kept it, and have reason to bless the day that I made so good a resolution. After losing my basket of goods, the winner gave me articles amounting to a few shillings, and I began the world once more. Shortly afterwards I commenced rag gatherer, and changed my goods for old rags, of course not refusing cash in payment. My next step was to have some bills printed, whereon I requested all thrifty wives to look out their old rags or old metal, or old bones, and stating at the bottom that the bill would be called for, and that a good price in ready money would be given for all useless lumber, and some months at this business realized me a pretty sum of money. I was in possession of nearly 5L. Then I discontinued the rag gathering, not that the trade was declining, but I did not like it, I was ambitious. I purchased a neat box, and started to sell a little Birmingham jewelry. I was now respectably dressed, was getting a living, and had entirely left off stopping at common lodging houses, but I confined my visits to small villages, I was afraid of the law. And as I was pursuing my calling near Wakefield, a constable inquired for my hawker's license. I had none to produce. He took me into custody, and introduced me to a magistrate, who committed me to prison for a month, and took away my box of goods. I endured the month's imprisonment upon the silent system, they cut my hair short, and at the expiration of the term I was thrust out upon the world heartbroken, without a shilling, to beg, to steal, or to starve. I proceeded to Leeds, the fair was on at this time. I got engaged to assist a person, from whom I had been accustomed occasionally to purchase goods. He was a cheap John. In the course of the day he suggested that I should have a try at the hand selling. I mounted the platform, and succeeded beyond my own expectations or that of my master. He offered me a regular engagement, which I accepted. At times I would help him sell, and at other times I hawked with his license. I had regular wages, besides all I could get above a certain price that he placed upon each of the goods. I remained with this person some fifteen months, at the end of which period I commenced for myself, having saved nearly twenty-five L. I began at once the hand selling, and purchased a hawker's license, which enabled me to sell without danger. Then I always called at the constable's house, and gave a louder knock at his door than any other person's, proud of my authority, and assured of my safety. At first I borrowed an empty cart, in which I stood and sold my wares. I could chaff as well as the best, and was as good a salesman as most of them. After that I purchased a second-hand cart from a person who had lately started a wagon. I progressed and improved in circumstances, and at last bought a very handsome wagon for myself. I have now a nice caravan, and good stock of goods, worth at least 500 L. Money I have but little. I always invested in goods. I am married, and have got a family. I always travel in the summer, but remain at home during the winter. My wife never travels. She remains behind, and manages a little swag shop, which always turns in at least the family expenses. The Street Sellers of Cutlery The cutlery sold in the streets of London consists of razors, pen knives, pocket knives, table and carving knives and forks, scissors, shears, nail filers, and occasionally, if ordered, lancets. The knives are of various kinds, such as sailors' knives, with a hole through the handle, butchers' knives, together with choppers and steels, sold principally at Newgate and Billingsgate markets, and round about the docks. Oyster and fish knives, sold principally at Billingsgate and Hungerford markets, bread knives, hawked at the baker's shops, ham and beef knives, hawked at the ham and beef shops, cheese knives with tasters, and ham triers, shoemakers' knives and a variety of others. These articles are usually purchased at the swag shops, and the prices of them vary from two one-half d. to ones. One one-half d each. 
They are bought either by the dozen, half dozen, or singly, according to the extent of the street seller's stock money. Hence it would appear that the street seller of cutlery can begin business with only a few pence, but it is only when the swag shopkeeper has known the street seller that he will consent to sell one knife alone, to sell again. To street sellers with whom he is unacquainted, he will not vend less than half a dozen. Even where the street seller is known, he has, if cracked up, to beg hard, I am told, before he can induce the warehouseman to let him have only one article. The swag shops won't be bothered with it, say the men, what are our troubles to them? If the rain starves us out and makes us eat up all our stock money, what is it to such folks? They wouldn't let us have even a row of pins without the money for them, no, not if we was to drop down dead for want of bread in their shops. They have been deceived by such a many that now they won't listen to none. I subjoin a list of the prices paid and received by the street sellers of cutlery for the principal articles in which they deal. Lowest price paid. Per half dozen sold at in the streets, highest price paid. Per half dozen sold at in the streets. S. DSDSDSD. Table knives and forks 13205076. Ditto, without forks 09134060. Pocket, knives 10164060. Pen, knives 19262639. Razors 19265076. Scissors 03160061926. Their usual rate of profit is 50%. But rather than refuse a ready sale the street cutlery seller will often take much less. Many of the sellers only pursue the trade for a few weeks in the year. A number of the Irish laborers take to it in the winter time when they can get no work. Some few of the sellers are countrymen, but these mostly follow the business continuously. I don't see as there is hardly one upon the list as has ever been a cutler by trade, said one street seller to me, and certainly none of the cutlery sellers have ever belonged to Sheffield, they may say so, but it's only a dodge. The cutlery street sellers are not one quarter so numerous as they were two years back. The reason is, I am told, that things are got so bad a man can't live by the trade, mayhap he has to walk three miles now before he can sell for ones. A knife that has cost him eight one half d, and then mayhap he is faint, and what's three one half d, sir, to keep body and soul together, when a man most likely has had no victuals all the day before. If they had a good bit of stock they might perhaps get a crust, they say. Things within the last two or three years, to quote the words of one of my informants, have been getting much worse in the streets, especially in the cutlery line. I can't give no account for it, I'm sure, sir, the sellers have not been half as many as they were. What's become of them that's gone, I can't tell, they're in the workhouse, I dare say. But, notwithstanding this decrease in the number of sellers, there is a greater difficulty to vend their goods now than formerly. It's all owing to the times, that's all I can say. People, shopkeepers, and all says to me, I can't tell why things is so bad, and has been so bad in trade, but so they is. We has to walk farther to sell our goods, and people beat us down so terrible hard, that we can't get a penny out of them when we do sell. Sometimes they offers me 9d, yes, and often 6d. For an 8 one half d. Knife, and often enough 4d. For one that stands you in 3 3 fourth d dot, a 1 fourth d. Profit, think of that, sir. Then they say, well, my man, will you take my money? And so as to make you do so, they'll flash it before your eyes, as if they knew you was a starving, and would be sure to be took in by the sight of it. Yes, sir, it is a very hard life, and we has to put up with a good deal, a good deal, starvation and hard dealing, and insults and knockings about, and all. And then you see the swag shops is almost as hard on us as the buyers. The swagmen will say, if you merely makes a remark, that a knife they've sold you is cracked in the handle, oh, is it, let me see whereabouts. And when you hands it to M to show it M, they'll put it back where they took it from, and tell you, you're too particular by half, my man. You'd better go and get your goods somewhere else. 
here take your money, and go on about your business, for we won't survey you at all. They'll do just the same with the scissors too, if you complains about their being a bit rusty. Go somewhere else, they'll say, we won't survey you. Ah, sir, that's what it is to be a poor man, to have your poverty flung in your teeth every minute. People says, to be poor and seem poor is the devil. But to be poor, and be treated like a dog merely because you are poor, surely is ten thousand times worse. A street seller nowadays is looked upon as a cadger, and treated as one. To try to get a living for oneself is to do something shameful in these times. The man then gave me the following history of himself. He was a kindly looking and hearty old man. He had on a ragged fustian jacket, over which he wore a black greasy looking and tattered oilskin coat, the collar of this was torn away, and the green baize lining alone visible. His waistcoat was patched in every direction, while his trousers appeared to be of corduroy, but the grease and mud was so thick upon them, that it was difficult to tell of what material they were made. His shoes, or rather what remained of them, were tied on his feet with pieces of string. His appearance altogether denoted great poverty. My father was a farmer, sir. He had two farms, about eight hundred acres in all. I was one of eleven, ten sons and one daughter. Seven years before my father's death he left his farm, and went to live on his money. He had made a good bit at farming, but when he died it was all gone, and we was left to shift as we could. I had little or no education. My brothers could read and write, but I didn't take to it, I went a bird's nesting, boy-like, instead, so that what little I did learn I have forgot. I am very sorry for that now. I used to drive the plough, and go a-harrowing for father. I was brought up to nothing else. When father died, I thought as I should like to see London. I was a mere lad, about twenty, and so I strolled up to town. I had tens. With me, and that, with a bundle, was all that I possessed in the world. When I got to London I went to lodge at a public house, the Red Lion, in Great Wild Street, and while I was there I sought about for work, but could not get any. When all was gone, I was turned out into the streets, and walked about for two days and two nights, without a bed, or a bit to eat, unless what I picked out of the gutter, and eat like a dog, orange peel and old cabbage stumps. Indeed anything I could find. When I was very hard put to it, I was coming down Drury Lane, and I looked in, quite casual-like, to ask for a job of work at the shop of Mr. Bolton, the needlemaker from Redditch. I told him as how I was nigh starving, and would do anything to get a crust, I didn't mind what I put my hand to. He said he would try me, and gave me two packets of needles to sell, they was the golden eyed ones of that time of day and he said when I had got rid of them I was to come back to him, and I should have two packets more. He told me the price to ask, sixpence a paper, and away I went like a sand boy, and got rid of the two in an hour and a half. Then I went back, and when I told him what I'd done, he shook hands with me, and said, as he burst out laughing, now, you see I've made a man of you. Oh, he was an uncommon nice gentleman. Then he told me to keep the shilling I had taken, and said he would trust me with two more packets. I sold them, and two others besides, that day. Then, he says, I shall give you something else, and he let me have two packets of tailor's needles and half a dozen of tailor's thimbles. He told me how to sell them, and where to go, and on them I did better. I went round to the tailor's shops and sold a good lot, but at last they stopped me, because I was taking the bread out of the mouths of the poor blind needle sellers what supplies the journeyman tailors at the West End. Then Mr. Bolton sent me down to one of his relations, a Mr. Crooks, in Fetter Lane, who was a Sheffield man, and sold cutlery to the hawkers, and Mr. Crooks and Mr. Bolton sought me up between them, and so I've followed the line ever since. I dare say I shall continue in it to my dying day. After I got fairly set a-going, I used to make, take good and bad, wet and dry days together, eighteenths. A week. Three shillings a day was what I calculated on at the least, and to do that I was obligated to take between two L. And three L. A week, or about eight or nine shillings each day. 
I went on doing this for upwards of thirty year. I have been nearly forty years, altogether, in the streets, selling cutlery. I did very tidy till about four years back, I generally made from eighteens. To one L. A week up to that time. I used to go round the country, to Margate, Brighton, Portsmouth, I mostly travelled by the coast, calling at all the seaport towns, for I always did best among the sailors. I went away every spring time, and came to London again at the fall of the year. Sixteen year ago, I married the widow of a printer, a pressman, she had no money, but you see I had no home, and I thought I should be more comfortable, and so I have been, a great deal more comfortable, and so I should be now. If things hadn't got so bad. For a year ago, as I was a-telling you, it was just after the railways had knocked off work, things began to get uncommon bad, before then, I had as good as thirties. Or forties. Stock, and when things got slack, it went away, little by little. I couldn't make profit enough to support me and my old woman, she has got the rheumatics and can't earn me a halfpenny or a farden in the world, she hasn't done so for years. When I didn't make enough to live upon, of course I was obligated to break into my stock, so there it kept going shilling by shilling, and sixpence by sixpence, until I had got nothing left to work upon, not a halfpenny. You see, four or five months ago, I was took very bad with the rheumatic fever and gout. I got wet through in the streets, and my clothes dried on me, and the next day I was taken bad with pains in my limbs, and then everything that would fetch me a penny went to the pawn shop. All my own and my old woman's clothes went to get us food, blankets, sheets and all. I never would go nigh the parish, I couldn't bring myself to have the talk about it. When I got well and out into the streets again, I borrowed twos. Or threes. Of my landlady, I have lived with her these three years, to get my stock again, but you see that got me so few things, that I couldn't fetch myself up. I lost the greater portion of my time in going backwards and forwards to the shop to get fresh goods as fast as I sold them, and so what I took wasn't enough to earn the commonest living for me and my missus. Since December we have been nearly starving, and that's as true as you have got the pen in your very hand. Sunday after Sunday we have been without a bit of dinner, and I have laid abed all day because we have had no coal, and then been obligated to go out on Monday morning without a bit of victuals between my lips. I've been so faint I couldn't hardly walk. I've picked the crusts off the tables of the tap rooms where I have been to hawk my goods, and put them in my pocket to eat them on the sly. Wet and dry I'm obligated to be out. Let it come down ever so hard I must be in it, with scarcely a bit of shoe, and turn sixty years old, as I am. Look here, sir, he said, holding up his foot, look at these shoes, the sauls is all loose, you see, and let water. On wet days I hawk my goods to respectable shops, tap rooms is no good, decent people merely get insulted there. But in most of the shops as I goes to people tells me, my good man it is as much as we can do to keep ourselves and our family in these cutting times. Now, just to show you what I done last week. Sunday, I laid a bed all day and had no dinner. Monday, I went out in the morning without a morsel between my lips, and with only eight one half d. For stock money, with that I bought a knife and sold it for a shilling, and then I got another and another after that, and that was my day's work, three times three one half d. Or ten one half d. In all, to keep the two of us. Tuesday, I sold a pair of small scissors and two little pearl-handled knives, at 6 d. Each article, and cleared 10 one half d. On the whole, and that is all I did. Wednesday, I sold a razor strop for 6 d. A four-bladed knife for a shilling, and a small hone for 6 d, by these I cleared 10 d. Altogether. Thursday, I sold a pair of razors for a shilling, clearing by the whole 11 one half d. Friday, I got rid of a pair of razors for ones. 9d, and got 9d. Clear. I added up the week's profits and found they amounted to fours. 3 one half d that's about right, said the man, out of that I shall have to pay ones. For my week's rent. We've got a kitchen, so that I leave you to judge how we too can live out of what's remaining. 
I told him it would NT average quite 6D. A day. That's about it, he replied, we have half a loaf of bread a day, and that thank God is only five farthings now. This lasts us the day, with two penny worth of bits of meat that my old woman buys at a ham shop, where they pair the hams and puts the pairings by on plates to sell to poor people. And when she can't get that, she buys half a sheep's head, one that's three or four days old, for then they sells m to the poor for one one half d. The half, and these with three fourth d. Worth of tea, and one half d. Worth of sugar, one fourth d. For a candle, one d. Of coal, that's seven pounds, and three fourth d. Worth of coke, that's half a peck, makes up all we gets. These items amount to six one half d. In all. That's how we do when we can get it, and when we can't, why we lays in bed and goes without altogether. Of the blind street sellers of tailors. Needles, etc. It is customary with many trades, for the journeymen to buy such articles as they require in their business of those members of their craft who have become incapacitated for work either by old age, or by some affliction. The tailors, the shoemakers, the carpenters, and many others do this. These sellers are, perhaps, the most exemplary instances of men driven to the streets, or to hawking for a means of living. And they, one and all, are distinguished by that horror of the workhouse which I have before spoken of as constituting a peculiar feature in the operative's character. At present I purpose treating of the street sellers of needles and trimmings to the tailors. There are, I am informed, two dozen broken-down journeyman tailors pursuing this avocation in and around London. There may be more, said one who had lost his sight stitching, but I get my information from the needle warehouse, where we all buy our goods, and the lady there told me she knew as many as twenty-four hawkers who were once tailors. These are all either decayed journeymen, or their widows. Some are incapacitated by age, being between sixty and seventy years old, the greater part of the aged journeymen, however, are inmates of the tailor's almshouses. I am not aware, said my informant, of there being more than one very old man hawking needles to the tailors, though there may be many that I know nothing about. The one I am acquainted with is close upon eighty, and he is a very respectable man, much esteemed in St. James's and St. George's. He sells needles, and London labour and the London poor, to the journeymen, he is very feeble indeed, and can scarcely get along. Of the two dozen needle sellers above mentioned, there are only six who confine their rounds solely to the metropolis. Out of these six my informant knew two who were blind beside himself, one of these sells to the journeyman in the city. There are other blind tailors who were formerly hawkers of needles, but being unable to realize a subsistence thereby, have been obliged to become inmates of the workhouses, others have recently gained admission into the almshouses. Last February, I am assured, there were two blind needle sellers, and two decrepit, in St. James's workhouse. There are, moreover, two widows selling tailors' needles in London. One of these, I am told, is wretchedly poor, being eat up with the rheumatics, and scarcely able to move, she is the relict of a blind journeyman, and well known in St. James's. The other widow is now in ST. Pancras workhouse, having been unable, to use the words of my informant, to get anything to keep life and soul together at the needle trade, she, too, I am told, is well known to the journeyman. The tailor's needle sellers confining themselves more particularly to London consist of, at present, one old man, three blind, one paralyzed, and one widow, besides these, there are now in the almshouses, two decrepit and one paralyzed. And one widow in the workhouse, all of whom, till recently, were needle sellers, and originally connected with the trade. That is all that I believe are now in London, said one to me, I should, I think, know if there were more. For it is not from one place we get our articles, but many, and there I hear that six is about the number of tailors hawkers in town, the rest of the two dozen hawkers that I spoke of go a little way out into the suburbs. The six, however, stick to London altogether. The needle sellers who go into the country, I am told, travel as far as Reading, westward, and to Gravesend, in the opposite direction, or Brentwood, in Essex. 
and they will keep going backards and forwards to the metropolis immediately their stock is exhausted. These persons sell not only tailor's needles, but women's needles as well, and stay laces and cottons, and small wear in general, which they get from shepherds, in Compton Street. They have all been tailors, and are incapacitated from labor either by old age or some affliction. There was one widow of a tailor among the number, but it is believed she is now either too old to continue her journeys, or else that she is deceased. The town sellers confine their peregrinations mostly to the parishes of St. James's and St. George's, my informant was not aware that any went even into Marylebone. One travels the city, while the other five keep to the West End. They all sell thimbles, needles, inch measures, bodkins, inch sticks, scissors, when they can get them, I was told, and that's very seldom, and beeswax, based in cotton, and, many of them, publications. The publications vended by these men are principally the cheap periodicals of the day, and two of these street sellers, I am informed, do much better with the sale of publications than by the trimmings. They get money, sir, said one man to me, while we are starving. They have their set customers and have only to go round and leave the paper, and then to get their money on the Monday morning. The tailors hawkers buy their trimmings mostly at the retail shops. They have not stock money sufficient, I am assured, to purchase at the wholesale houses, for such a thing as a paper of needles large tradesmen don't care about of selling us poor men. They tell me that if they could buy wholesale they could get their goods one-fourth cheaper, and to be obligated to purchase retail is a great drawback on their profits. They call at the principal tailor's workshops and solicit custom of the journeymen. They are almost all known to the trade, both masters and men, and, having no other means of living, they are allowed to enter the master's shops, though some of the masters, such as Allen, in Bond Street, Curlewis, Jarvis, and Jones, in Conduit Street, and others, refuse the poor fellows even this small privilege. The journeymen treat them very kindly, the needle sellers tell me, and generally give them part of the provisions they have brought with them to the shop. If it was not for this the needle sellers, I am assured, could hardly live at all. There's that boy there, said a blind tailor, speaking of the youth who had led him to my house, and who sat on the stool fast asleep by the fire, I'm sure he must have starved this winter if it hadn't been for the goodness of the men to us. For it's little that me and his mother has to give him. She's gone almost as blind as myself working at the sank work, making up soldiers' clothing. Oh, ours is a miserable life, sir, worn out, blind with overwork, and scarcely a hole to put one's head in, or a bit to put in one's mouth. God Almighty knows that's the bare truth, sir. Sometimes the hawkers go on their rounds and take only two d, but that is not often, sometimes they take fives. In a day, and, that is the greatest sum, said my informant, I ever took. What others might do I can't say, but that I'm confident is about the highest takings. In the summer three months the average takings rise to fours. Per day, but in the winter they fall to ones, or at the outside ones. 6d. The business lasts only for three hours and a half each day, that is from eight till half past eleven in the morning, after that no good is to be done. Then the needle sellers, I am told, go home, and the reason of this is, I am told, if they appear in the public streets selling or soliciting alms. The blind are exempted from becoming recipients of the benefits of many of the charitable institutions. The blind man whom I saw, told me that after he had done work and returned home, he occupied himself with pressing the seams of the soldier's clothes when his missus had sewed them. The tailor's needle sellers are all married, and one of the wives has a mangle, and, perhaps, said my informant, the blind husband turns the mangle when he goes home, but I can't say. Another wife is a book folder, but she has no work. The needles they usually sell five a penny to the journeyman, but the most of the journeymen will take but four, they say, we can't get a living at all if we sell the needles cheaper. The journeymen are mostly very considerate, very indeed. Much more than the masters, for the masters won't hardly look at us. I don't know that a master ever gave me a farden, and yet there's some of them very soothing and kind in speaking. The profit in the needles, I am told, 
is rather more than 100%, but, say the sellers, only think, sir, we must get rid of 150 needles even to take threes. The most we ever sell in one shop is 6d. Worth, and the usual amount is 2d. Worth. You can easy tell how many shops we must travel round to, in order to get rid of threes. Worth. Take one shop with another, the good with the bad, they tell me they make about 1d. Profit from each they visit. The profit on the rest of the articles they vend is about 20%, and they calculate that all the year round, summer and winter, they may be said to take twos. A day, or twelves. A week, out of which they clear from fives. To fives. 6d. They sell far more needles than anything else. Some of the blind needle sellers make their own beeswax into shapes, pennyworths, themselves, melting into and pouring into small molds. The blind needle seller whom I saw was a respectable looking man, with the same delicacy of hand as is peculiar to tailors, and which forms so marked a contrast to the horny palms of other workmen. He was tall and thin, and had that upward look remarkable in all blind men. His eyes gave no signs of blindness, the pupils being full and black, except that they appeared to be directed to no one object, and though fixed, were so without the least expression of observation. His long black surtout, though faded in color, was far from ragged, having been patched and stitched in many places, while his cloth waistcoat and trousers were clean and neat, very different from the garments of street sellers in general. In his hand he carried his stick, which, as he sat, he seemed afraid to part with, for he held it fast between his knees. He came to me accompanied by his son, a good-looking rough-headed lad, habited in a washed-out blue French kind of pinafore, and whose duty it was to lead his blind father about on his rounds. Though the boy was decently clad, still his clothes, like those of his father, bore many traces of that respectable kind of poverty which seeks by continuous mending to hide its rags from the world. The face of the father, too, was pinched, while there was a plaintiveness about his voice that told of a wretched spirit broken and afflicted man. Altogether he was one of the better kind of handicraftsmen, one of those fine specimens of the operatives of this country, independent even in their helplessness, scorning to beg. And proud to be able to give some little equivalent for the money bestowed on them. I have already given accounts of the beaten out mechanic from those who certainly cannot be accused of an excess of sympathy for the poor, namely the poor law commissioners and masters of workhouses. And I can only add, that all my experience goes fully to bear out the justice of these statements. As I said before, the class who are driven to the streets to which the beaten out or incapacitated operative belongs, is, of all others, the most deserving of our sympathy. And the following biography of one of this order is given to teach us to look with a kindly eye upon the many who are forced to become street sellers as the sole means of saving themselves from the degradation of pauperism or beggary. I am forty-five years of age next June, said the blind tailor. It is upwards of thirty years since I first went to work at the tailoring trade in London. I learned my business under one of the old hands at Mr. Cook's, in Poland Street, and after that went to work at Guthrie's, in Bond Street. I belonged to the society held at the Old White Hart. I continued working for the honorable trade and belonging to society for about fifteen years. My weekly earnings then averaged 1 L. 16 a week while I was at work, and for several years I was seldom out of work, for when I got into a shop it was a long time before I got out again. I was not married then. I lived in a first-floor back room, well furnished, and could do very comfortably indeed. I saved often my fifteenths. Or sixteenths. In a week, and was worth a good bit of money up to the time of my first illness. At one period I had nearly fifty L. By me, and had it not been for vacations, and slack seasons, I should have put by more, but you see to be out of work even a few weeks makes a large hole in a journeyman's savings. All this time I subscribed regularly to society, and knew that if I got superannuated I should be comfortably maintained by the trade. I felt quite happy with the consciousness of being provided for in my old age or affliction then, and if it had not been for that perhaps I might have saved more even than I did. I went on in this way, as I said before, 
for fifteen years, and no one could have been happier than I was, not a working man in all England couldn't. I had my silver watch and chain. I could lay out my trifle every week in a few books, and used to have a trip now and then up and down the river, just to blow the London smoke off, you know. About fifteen years ago my eyes began to fail me without any pain at all. They got to have as it were a thick mist, like smoke, before them. I couldn't see anything clear. Working by gaslight at first weakened and at last destroyed the nerve altogether. I'm now in total darkness. I can only tell when the gas is lighted by the heat of it. It is not the black clothes that is trying to the sight, black is the steadiest of all colors to work at. White and all bright colors makes the eyes water after looking at them for any long time, but of all colors scarlet, such as is used for regimentals, is the most blinding, it seems to burn the eyeballs, and makes them ache dreadful. After working at red there's always flying colors before the eyes, there's no steady color to be seen in anything for some time. Everything seems all of a twitter, and to keep changing its tint. There's more military tailors blind than any others. A great number of tailors go blind, but a great many more has lost their sight since gaslight has come up. Candlelight was not half so pernicious to the sight. Gaslight is so very heating, and there's such a glare with it that it makes the eyes throb, and shoot too, if you work long by it. I've often continued working past midnight with no other light than that, and then my eyes used to feel like two bits of burning coals in my head. And you see, sir, the worst of it was, as I found my sight going bad I was obliged to try it more, so as to keep up with my mates in the shop. At last my eyes got so weak that I was compelled to give up work, and go into the country, and there I stopped, living on my savings, and unable to do any work for fear of losing my sight altogether. I was away about three years, and then all my money was gone, and I was obligated, in spite of my eyes, to go back to work again. But then, with my sight defective as it was, I could get no employment at the honorable trade, and so I had to take a seat in a shop at one of the cheap houses in the city, and that was the ruin of me entirely. For working there, of course I got scratched from the trade society, and so lost all hope of being provided for by them in my helplessness. The workshop at this cheap house was both small and badly ventilated. It was about seven foot square, and so low, that as you sought on the floor you could touch the ceiling with the tip of your finger. In this place seven of us worked, three on each side and one in the middle. Two of my shopmates were boys, or else I am sure it would not have held us all. There was no chimney, nor no window that could be opened to let the air in. It was lighted by a skylight, and this would neither open nor shut. The only means for letting out the foul air was one of them working ventilators, like cockades, you know, sir, fixed in one of the panes of glass. But this wouldn't work, so there we were, often from five in the morning till ten at night, working in this dreadful place. There was no fire in the winter, though we never needed one, for the workshop was over hot from the suffocation, and in the summer it was like an oven. This is what it was in the daytime, but mortal tongue can't tell what it was at night, with the two gas lights burning away, and almost stifling us. Many a time some of the men has been carried out by the others fainting for air. They all fell ill, every one of them, and I lost my eyes and my living entirely by it. We spoke to the master repeatedly, telling him he was killing us, and though when he came up to the workshop himself, he was nearly blown back by the stench and heat. He would not let us have any other room to work in, and yet he'd plenty of convenience upstairs. He paid little more than half the regular wages, and employed such men as myself, only those who couldn't get anything better to do. What with illness and all, I don't think my wages there averaged above twelves. A week, sometimes I could make one L. In the week, but then, the next week, maybe I'd be ill, and would get but a few shillings. It was impossible to save anything then, even to pay one's way was a difficulty, and, at last, I was seized with rheumatics on the brain, and obliged to go into St. Thomas's Hospital. I was there eleven months, and came out stone blind. I am convinced I lost my eyesight by working in that cheap shop. Nothing on earth will ever persuade me to the contrary, 
and what's more, my master robbed me of a third of my wages and my sight too, and left me helpless in the world, as, God knows, I am now. It is by the ruin of such men as me that these masters are enabled to undersell the better shops. They get hold of the men whose eyes are just beginning to fail them, like mine did, because they know they can get them to work cheap, and then, just at the time when a journeyman requires to be in the best of shops, have the best of air. And to work as little by gaslight as possible, they puts him into a hole of a place that would stifle a rat, and keeps him working there half the night through. That's the way, sir, the cheap clothes is produced, by making blind beggars of the workmen, like myself, and throwing us on the parish in our old age. You are right, sir, they not only robs the men but the ratepayers too. Well, sir, as I said, I come out of the hospital stone blind, and have been in darkness ever since, and that's near upon ten years ago. I often dream of colors, and see the most delightful pictures in the world. Nothing that I ever beheld with my eyes can equal them, they're so brilliant, and clear, and beautiful. I see then the features and figures of all my old friends, and I can't tell you how pleasurable it is to me. When I have such dreams they so excite me that I am ill all the next day. I often see, too, the fields, with the cows grazing on a beautiful green pasture, and the flowers, just at twilight-like, closing up their blossoms as they do. I never dream of rivers, nor do I ever remember seeing a field of corn in my visions, it's strange I never dreamt in any shape of the corn or the rivers, but maybe I didn't take so much notice of them as of the others. Sometimes I see the sky, and very often indeed there's a rainbow in it, with all kinds of beautiful colors. The sun is a thing I often dream about seeing, going down like a ball of fire at the close of the day. I never dreamt of the stars, nor the moon, it's mostly bright colors that I see. I have been under all the oculists I could hear of, Mr. Turnbull, in Russell Square, but he did me no good, then I went to Charing Cross, under Mr. Guthrie, and he gave me a blind certificate, and made me a present of half a sovereign, he told me not to have my eyes tampered with again, as the optic nerve was totally decayed. Oh, yes. If I had all the riches in the world I'd give them every one to get my sight back, for it's the greatest pressure to me to be in darkness. God help me. I know I am a sinner, and believe I'm so afflicted on account of my sins. No, sir, it's nothing like when you shut your eyes, when I had my sight, and closed mine, I remember I could still see the light through the lids, the very same as when you hold your hand up before the candle. But mine's far darker than that, pitch black. I see a dark mass like before me, and never any change, everlasting darkness, and no chance of a light or shade in this world. But I feel consolated somehow, now it is settled. Although it's a very poor comfort after all. I go along the streets in great fear. If a baby have hold of me, I am firm, but by myself, I reel about like a drunken man. I feel very timid unless I have hold of something, not to support me, but to assure me I shall not fall. If I was going down your staircase, sir, I should be all right so long as I touched the banister, but if I missed that, I'm sure I should grow so giddy and nervous I should fall from the top to the bottom. After losing my sight, I found a great difficulty in putting my food into my mouth, for a long time, six months or better, and I was obliged to have someone to guide my hand, for I used often to put the fork up to my forehead instead of my mouth. Shortly after my becoming quite blind, I found all my other senses much quickened, my hearing, feeling, and reckoning. I got to like music very much indeed. It seemed to elevate me, to animate and cheer me much more than it did before, and so much so now, that when it ceases, I feel duller than ever. It sounds as if it was in a wilderness to me, I can't tell why, but that's all I can compare it to. As if I was quite alone with it. My smell and taste is very acute, he was given some violets to smell, oh, that's beautiful, he cried, very reviving indeed. Often of an evening, I can see things in my imagination, and that's why I like to sit alone then, for of all the beautiful thoughts that ever a man possessed, there's none to equal a blind man's, when he's by himself. I don't see my early home, but occurrences that has recently took place. 
I see them all plain before me, in colors as vivid as if I had my sight again, and the people all dressed in the fashion of my time. The clothes seem to make a great impression on me, and I often sit and see in my mind Master Taylor's trying a coat on a gentleman, and pulling it here and there. The figures keep passing before me like soldiers, and often I'm so took by them that I forget I'm blind, and turn my head round to look after them as they pass by me. But that sort of thinking would throw me into a melancholy, it's too exciting while it lasts, and then leaves me dreadful dull afterwards. I have got much more melancholy since my blindness. Before then, I was not seriously given, but now I find great consolation in religion. I think my blindness is sent to try my patience and resignation, and I pray to the Almighty to give me strength to bear with my affliction. I was quick and hot-tempered before I was blind, but since then, I have got less hasty-like, all other troubles appears nothing to me. Sometimes I revile against my affliction, too frequently, but that is at my thoughtless moments, for when I'm calm and serious, I feel thankful that the Almighty has touched me with His correcting rod. And then I'm happy and at peace with all the world. If I had run my race, and not been stopped, I might never have believed there was a God. My wife works at the th sank work. She makes soldiers' coats, she gets ones. One d for making one, and that's nearly a day and a half's work. Then she has to find her own trimmings, and they're one d. It takes her sixteen hours to finish one garment, and the overwork at that is beginning to make her like as I was myself. If she takes up a book to read to me now, it's all like a dirty mass before her, and that's just as my sight was before I lost it altogether. She slaves hard to help me, she's anxious and willing, indeed too much so. If she could get constant work, she might perhaps make about sevens. A week, but as it is, her earnings are, take one week with another, not more than threes. Last week she earned fives, but that was the first job of work she'd had to do for two months. I think the two of us make on an average about eights, and out of that there is three people to keep, our two selves and our boy. Our rent is twos. Six d, so that after paying that, we has about fives. Six d. Left for food, firing, and clothing for the whole of us. How we do it I can't tell, but I know we live very, very hard, mostly on pieces of bread that the men gives to me and my boy, as we go round to the workshops. If we was any of us to fall ill, we must all go to the parish, if my boy was to go sick, I should be left without anyone to lead me about, and that would be as bad as if I was laid up myself. And if anything was to happen to my wife, I'd be done clean altogether. But yet the Lord is very good, and we'd get out of that, I dare say. If anything was to drive me to the parish, I should lose all hopes of getting some help from the blind institutions, and so I dread the workhouse worse than all. I'd sooner die on the step of a door, any time, than go there and be what they call well kept. I don't know why I should have a dislike to going there, but yet I do possess it. I do believe, that any one that is willing to work for their bread, hates a workhouse, for the workhouse coat is a slothful, degrading badge. After a man has had one on his back, he's never the same. I would nt go for an order for relief so long as I could get a halfpenny loaf in twenty-four hours. If I could only get some friend to give me a letter of recommendation to Mr. Day's charity for the blind, I should be happy for the rest of my days. I could give the best of references to anyone who would take pity on me in my affliction. The public house hawkers of metal. Spoons, etc. The public house hawkers are never so prosperous as those who confine their calling to private houses. They are often invited to partake of drink, are not the most industrious class of hawkers, and, to use their own language, are more frequently hard up than those who keep away from taproom selling. The profits of the small hawkers in public houses vary considerably. Some of them, when they have earned a shilling or two, are content to spend it before they leave the taproom, and so they lose both their stock and profit. I do not mean to infer that this is the case with the whole of the public house hawkers, for some among them strive hard to better their condition, and occasionally succeed. But there are too many who are content to draw out their existence by always suffering tomorrow to provide for itself. 
The man who gave me the routine of small hawker's business I found in a tap room in Ratcliffe Highway. He was hawking teaspoons, and all the stock he possessed was half a dozen. These he importuned me to purchase with great earnestness. He prayed of me to lay out a trifle with him. He had not taken a penny the whole day he said, and had nothing to eat. What's much worse for such as me, he added, I'm dying for a glass of rum. I might have his teaspoons, he told me, at any price. If I would but pay for a glass of rum for him they should be mine. I assured him some bread and cheese would do him more good, as he had not eaten anything that day, but still he would have the rum. With a trembling hand he threw the liquor down his throat, smacked his lips, and said that their dram has saved my life. A few minutes afterwards he sold his spoons to a customer for sixpence, and he had another glass of rum. Now, said he, I'm all right for business, if I'd tuppence more I could buy a dozen teaspoons, and I should earn a bob or two yet before I went to bed. After this he grew communicative, and told me he was as good a hawker as there was in London, and he thought he could do more than any other man with a small stock. He had two or three times resolved to better himself, and had, put in the pin, meaning he had made a vow to refrain from drinking. But he had broken out again and gone on in his old course until he had melted the whole of his stock, though twice it had, during his sobriety, amounted to 5L, and was often worth between 2L and 3L. It was almost maddening when he came to his senses, he said, to find he had acted so foolishly. Indeed, it was so disheartening to discover all the result of his good resolutions dissipated in a moment, that he declared he never intended to try again. After having drunk out his stock, he would if possible commence with half a dozen Britannia metal teaspoons, these cost him 6d, and would sell for 9d. Or ones. When one half dozen were disposed of he would procure another, adding a knife, or a comb or two. If entirely destitute, he would stick a needle in a cork, and request to know of, the parties, assembled in some tap room, if they wanted anything in the ironmongery line, though the needle was all the stock he had. This was done for the purpose of, raising the wind, and by it he would be sure to obtain a glass or two of ale if he introduced himself with his, ironmongery establishment, among the sailors. Sometimes he would manage to beg a few pence, and then he would purchase a knife, pair of braces, or half a dozen teaspoons, and begin to practice his trade in a legitimate manner. In answer to my inquiry he said he had not always been a hawker. His father had been a soldier, and he had worked in the armory. His father had been discharged upon a pension, and he, the hawker, left the army with his parents. He had never enlisted while his father was a soldier, but he had since. His mother adopted the business of a hawker upon the receipt of his father's first quarter's pension, and then he used to accompany her on her rounds. With the pension and the mother's exertions they managed to subsist tolerably well. Being the only child, I was foolishly spoilt by my parents, he said, and when I was a very young man, fifteen or sixteen, I became a great trouble to them. At eighteen I enlisted in the Seventh Fusiliers, remained in the regiment three months, and then, at my own request, was bought off. My mother sold off most of her stock of goods to raise the money, twenty pounds. When I returned home I could not think of trudging by my mother's side, as I had been used to do when carrying the goods, nor did I feel inclined to exert myself in any way for my own support. I considered my mother had a right to keep me without my working, and she, poor thing, thought so too. I was not only supported in idleness, but my mother would give me many a shilling, though she could ill afford it, for me to spend with my companions. I passed most of my time in a skittle ground. I was not what you might term a skittle sharp, for I never entered into a plot to victimize any person, although I confess I have often bet upon the greenness of those who were silly enough to make wagers that they could not possibly win. Sometimes, after I had lost the trifles supplied me by my mother, I would return, and be blackguard enough to assume the bully unless my demands on her for a further supply were attended to. Poor thing, she was very meek, and with tears in her eyes she would grant my request. I often weep when I think how I treated her, hear the tears trickle down the man's cheek, and yet, badly as I used her, in my heart I loved her very much. 
I got tired of the skittle grounds in consequence of getting into a hobble relative to a skittle swindle, some sharpers had obtained a flat, I was speculating in a small way, betting pennies and tuppences in such a manner as always to win. I was practicing upon the flat upon my own account, without having any connection with the others, they fleeced their dupe out of several pounds, and he made a row about it. The police interfered, and I was singled out as one of the gang. The principals were also apprehended, they got six months each, and I was accommodated with a month's board and lodging at the expense of the nation. I thought this at the time unjust, but I was as culpable as any of them, for at the time I only regretted I had not more money to stake larger wagers, and envied the other parties who were making a better thing of the business than I was. When I came out of jail, my poor mother treated me as a martyr. She thought I was as innocent as a child. Shortly after my release from prison my father died, and with him went the pension of course. I was then obligated to do something for myself. A few shillings worth of goods only were procured, for my father's funeral and my extravagances had sadly crippled my mother's means. I behaved very well for a short time. My mother then was often ill, and she never recovered the death of my father. In about a year after my father died I lost my mother, our stock of goods had dwindled down to a very poor lot, and I was obligated to ask relief of the parish towards her funeral expenses. When all was over, the value of my goods and cash did not amount to twenties. Ten years have elapsed since my mother's death, and I don't think I have ever been, during the whole period, sober for a month together. While I sat in this tap room, I counted in the course of an hour and a quarter, four hawkers of sheep's trotters, who visited the place, three sellers of shrimps, pickled whelks, and periwinkles, two baked potato sellers, eight song hawkers. The same number with lucifer matches, and three with braces, and k. Not one of these effected a sale. Of the street sellers of jewelry. The jewelry now sold in the streets far exceeds, both in cheapness and quality, what was known even ten years ago. Fifty years ago the jewelry itinerant trade was almost entirely, if not entirely, in the hands of Jews, who at any rate professed to sell really gold articles, and who asked large prices. But these traders have lost their command over this, as I have shown that they have over other street callings, as not a twelfth of the street jewelers are now Jews. A common trade among such street and country itinerant jewelers was in large watch seals, the bodies of which were of lead, more or less thickly plated with gold, and which were unsaleable even as old metal until broken to pieces. But not always saleable then. The street or itinerant trade was for a long time afterwards carried on only by those who were regularly licensed as hawkers, and who preferred barter or swapping to actual sale. The barter being usually for other and more solid articles of the goldsmith's trade. The introduction of mosaic and other cheap modes of manufacturing quasi-gold ornaments brought about considerable changes in the trade, pertaining, however, more to the general manufacture than to that prepared for the streets. The itinerants usually carry their wares in boxes or cases, which shut up close and can be slung on the shoulder for conveyance or hung round the neck for the purposes of sale. These cases are nearly all glazed. Within them the jewellery is disposed in such manner as, in the street seller's judgment, is the most attractive. A card of the larger brooches, or of cameos, often forms the centre, and the other space is occupied with the shawl pins, with their globular tops of scarlet or other coloured glass, rings, armlets, necklaces, a few earrings and eardrops and sometimes a few side combs, small medals for keepsakes, clasps, beads, and bead purses, ornamental buttons for dresses, gilt buckles for waist belts, thimbles, and k. constitute the street jeweler's stock in trade. The usual prices are from 2d. to 1s. 6d, the price most frequently obtained for any article being 3d. It will be seen from the enumeration of the articles, that the stock is such as is required for women's wear, and women are now almost the sole customers of the street jewellers. In my time, sir, said one elderly street trader, or rather, when I was a boy, and in my uncle's time, for he was in jewellery, and I helped him at times, quite different sorts of jewellery was sold, and quite different prices was had. 
what's a high figure now was a low figure then. I've known children's coral and bells in my uncle's stock, well, I don't know whether it was real coral or not, and big watch keys with colored stones in the center on M, such as I've seen old gents keep spinning round when they was talking. And big seals and watch chains. There weren't no guards then, as I remember. And there was plated fruit knives, silver, as near as a toucher, and silver pencils, pencil cases, and gilt lockets, to give your sweetheart your hair in for keepsakes. Lord bless you. Times is turned upside down. The disposition of the street stalls is somewhat after the same fashion as that in the itinerance box, with the advantage of a greater command of space. Some of the stalls, one in Tottenham Court Road, I may instance, and another in Whitechapel, make a great show. I did not hear of any in this branch of the jewelry trade who have been connected with it as working jewelers. I heard of two journeyman watchmakers and four clockmakers now selling jewelry, but often with other things, such as eyeglasses, in the street, but that is all. The street mass selling jewelry in town and country are, I believe, composed of the various classes who constitute the street traders generally. Of the nature of his present trade, and of the class of his customers, I had the following account from a man of twelve years' experience in the vending of street jewelry. It's not very easy to tell, sir, he said, what sells best. Four people begins to suspect everything, and seems to think they're done if they give 3D. For an agate brooch, and finds out it ain't set in gold. I think agate is about the best part of the trade now. It seems a stone as is easy imitated. Cornelians, too, ain't so bad in brooches, people likes the color. But not what they was, and not up to agates. But nothing is up to what it once was, not in the least. Sell twice as much, when you can, which often stands over till tomorrow come never, and get half the profit. I don't expect very much from the great exhibition. They sends goods so cheap from Germany, they'll think anything dear in London, if it's only at German prices. I think it's a mistake to fancy that the cheaper a jewelry article is the more you'll sell of it. You won't. People's of opinion, at least that's my notion of it, that it's so common everybody'll have it, and so they won't touch it. It's Thames water, sir, against beer, is poor low-priced jewelry, against tidy and fair-priced, but then the low-priced has now ruined the other sorts, for they're all thought to go under the same umbrella, all of a sort, ones. Or 1D. Why, as to who's the best customers, that depends on where you pitches your pitch, or works your round, and whether you are known, or are merely a upstart. But I can tell you, sir, who's been my best customers, and is yet, but not so good as they was, and that's women of the town, and mostly, for I've tried most places, about Ratcliffe Highway, Whitechapel, Mile End Road, Bethnal Green, and Oxford Street. The sailors' gals is the best of all, but a most all of them is very particular, and some is uncommon tiresome. I'm afeard, they says, this color don't suit my complexion, it's too light, or it's too dark. How does that ring show on my finger? I've known some of the fat and fair ones, what had been younger, but would be older, say, let me have a necklace of bright black beads, then things shows best with the fat, uns but in general them poor creatures is bad judges of what becomes them. The things they're the most particular of all in is necklaces. Amber and pearl sells most. I have them from 6D. To ones. 6D, I never get more than ones. 6D, Cornelian necklaces is most liked by children, and most bought for them. I've trusted the women of the town, and trust them still. One young woman in Shadwell took a fancy the t'other week for a pearl necklace, it became her so, which it didn't, and offered to pay me six d. A week for it if I wouldn't sell it away from her. The first week she paid six d, the second nothing, and next week the full tip, cause her jack had come home. I never lost a halfpenny by the women. Yes, they pays you a fairish price, but nothing more. Sometimes they've beat me down one d and has said, it's all the money I has. It's not very long ago that one of them offered me a fine gould watch which I could have bought at any price, for I saw she knew nothing of what it was worth. 
I never do anything that way. I believe a very few in my line does, for they can't give the prices the rich fences can. It's common enough for them gals to ask any street jeweler they knows how much a watch ought to pop for, or to sell for, afore they tries it on. But it isn't they as tries it on, sir, they get some respectable old lady, or old gent, to do that for them. I've had cigars and Cavendish of them, such as seamen had left behind them, you know, sir, I've never given money, only jewelry for it. Plenty of shopkeepers is glad to buy it of me, and not at a bad price. They asks no questions, and I tells them no lies. One reason why these gals buys free is that when the jewelry gets out of order or out of fashion, they can fling it away and get fresh, it's so cheap. When I've had no money on a day until I has sold to these women, I've often enough said, God bless them. Earrings is hardly any go now, sir, nothing to what they was, they're going out. The penny jeweler is little good. It's only children what buys, or gets it bought for them. I sell most of brooches from 3D. To 6D, very seldom higher, and bracelets, they calls them armlets now, at the same price. I buys all my goods at a swag shop, there's no other market. Watch guards was middling sale, both silver and gould, or washed white and washed yellow, and the swags made money in them, but instead of ones, they're not to be sold at a joey now, watchguards ain't, if a man patters ever so. I am informed that there are not less than 1,000 individuals who all buy their jewellery at the London swag shops, and sell it in the streets, with or without other articles, but principally without. And that of this number 500 are generally in London and its suburbs, including such places as Gravesend, Woolwich, and Greenwich. Of these traders about one-tenth are women, and in town about three-fifths are itinerant, and the others stationary. One half, or thereabouts, of the women, are the wives of street sellers, the others trade on their own account. A few, swap, jewellery for old clothes, with either the mistress or the maids. Four or five, when they see a favourable opportunity, offer to tell any servant maid her fortune. By this beautiful agate brooch, my dear, the woman will say, and I'll only charge you ones. 6d. A German thing, sir, costing her seven farthings one street jeweler informed me, and I'll tell you your fortune into the bargain. One bold hand calculated that when a street jeweler could display fifties worth of stock, he could clear, all the year round, fifteenths a week. People, said this man, as far as I've known the streets, like to buy of what they think is a respectable man, and seemingly well to do, they feel safe with him. Those, however, who cannot boast so large a stock of jewellery as fifties. Worth, may only clear tens. Instead of fifteenths. Weekly. One trader thought that the average earnings of his fraternity might be taken at twelves. A week. Another, and both judged from their own experience, thought tens. Six D was high enough. Calculating, then, at a weekly profit of tens. Six D, and a receipt of eighteenths. Per individual, we find twenty-three four hundred L. Expended in the street trade, including the sales at Gravesend, Woolwich, and Greenwich, where, both places being resorted to by pleasure seekers and seamen, the trade is sometimes considerable. Watches, which now are almost unknown in a regular street trade, they're forming an occasional part of it. Of the peddler jewellers. I have heard a manufacturer of Birmingham jewellery assert, that one pound of copper was sufficient to make ten L. Worth of jewellery, consequently, the material to provide the unmanufactured stock in trade of a wholesale dealer in Birmingham jewellery, is not over expensive. It may be imagined then that the peddlers who hawk jewellery do not invest a very great capital in the wares they sell, there are some few, however, who have very valuable stocks of goods, peddlers though they be. This trade is principally pursued by Jews, and to a great extent, especially in a small way, by foreign Jews. The Jews are, I think, more attentive to the wants of their poorer brethren than other people. And instead of supplying them with trifling sums of money, 
which must necessarily soon be expended, they give them small quantities of goods, so that they may immediately commence foraging for their own support. Many of these poor Jews, when provided with their stock of merchandise, can scarcely speak a word of English, and few of them know but little respecting the value of the goods they sell. They always take care to ask a good price, leaving plenty of room for abatement. I heard one observe that they could not easily be taken in by being overcharged, for according what they paid for the article they fixed the price upon it. Some of these men, notwithstanding their scanty knowledge of the trade at starting, have eventually become excellent judges of jewellery, some of them, moreover, have acquired riches in it. Indeed from the indomitable perseverance of the Hebrew race, success is generally the result of their untiring industry. If once you look at the goods of a Jew peddler, it is not an easy matter to get out of his clutches. It is not for want of perseverance if he does not bore and tease you, until at length you are glad to purchase some trifle to get rid of him. One of my informants tells me he is acquainted with several Jews, who now hold their heads high as merchants, and are considered very excellent judges of the wares they deal in, who originally began trading with but a small stock of jewellery. And that a charitable donation. As well as Jews there are Irishmen who deal in such commodities. The peddler generally has a mahogany box bound with brass, and which he carries with a strap hung across his shoulder. When he calls at a house, an inquiry is made whether there is any old silver or gold to dispose of. I will give you a full price for any such articles. If the lady or gentleman accosted seems to be likely to buy, the box is immediately opened in a tempting display of gold rings, chains, scent boxes, lockets, brooches, breastpins, bracelets, silver thimbles, and, and, are exposed to view. All the eloquence the peddler can command is now brought into play. The jewellery is arranged about the persons of his expected customers to the best advantage. The peddler says all he can think of to enhance their sale, he will chop and change for anything they may wish to dispose of, any old clothes, books, or useless lumber may be converted into ornaments for the hair or other parts of dress. The Irish peddler mostly confines his visits to the vicinity of large factories where there are many girls employed, these he supplies with earrings, necklaces, shawl pins, brooches, lockets, and which are bought wholesale at the following prices, earrings and drops at from threes. 6d to 12s. Per dozen pairs, the 3d. Earring is a neat little article, says my informant, and those sold at ones. Each, wholesale, are gorgeous-looking affairs. Many of the latter have been disposed of by the peddlers at 1L. The pair, and even a greater price. Necklaces are from fives. To 1L. Per dozen. Lockets may be purchased wholesale at from twos. To tens. Per dozen, guard chains, German silver, are fours. Per dozen gilt heavy-looking waistcoat chains success. Per dozen, and all other articles are equally low in price. The peddler jeweler can begin business, respectably, for two pounds. His box costs him sevens. 6d. Half a dozen pairs of earrings of six different sorts, threes, half a dozen lockets, various, ones. 9d. Half a dozen guard chains, twos, half a dozen shawl brooches, twos. 6d, one dozen breast pins, different kinds, threes. One dozen finger rings of various descriptions, threes. 6d, half a dozen brooches at 4d. Each, twos, one dozen necklaces, a variety, at success, three silver pencil cases at ones. 9d, each, fives. 3d, half a dozen waistcoat chains, threes. One silver toothpick, at ones. 6d, these make altogether two pounds. If the articles are arranged with taste and seeming care, as if they were very valuable, with jewellers wadding under each, and stuck on pink cards, and while the finger rings are inserted in the long narrow velvet-lined groove of the box, and the other to valuables, well spread about the little portable shop, they may be made to assume a very respectable and almost rich appearance. Many who now have large establishments commenced life with much less stock than is here mentioned. 
The Jews, I do not think, continues my informant, are the best salesmen. And the fact of their being Israelites is, in many instances, a bar to their success, country people, especially, are afraid of being taken in by them. The importunities and appeals of the Hebrew, however, are far more urgent than any other tradesman, and they always wait where they think there's the slightest chance of effecting a sale, until the door is slammed in their face. I believe there are not, at the present time, many, especially small traders, who deal exclusively in jewelry, they mostly add other small and light articles, such as fancy cutlery, side combs, and k. There may, at a rough guess, be five hundred of them traveling the country, half the number are poor foreign Jews, a quarter are Jews, who have, perhaps, followed the same calling for years. And the remaining quarter, a mixture of Irish and English, with a small preponderance of Irishmen. All these swap their goods for old gold and silver, and frequently realize a large sum, by changing the base metal for the sterling article. Their goods are always sold as being gold or silver, if asked whether a particular article be gold, they reply, it's jeweler's gold, is this ring gold, inquires the customer, taking one from the box, no, ma'am, I wouldn't deceive you. Is the answer, that is not gold, but here is one, adds the peddler, taking up one exactly of the same description, and which cost the same price, which is of a similar shape and fashion, and the best jeweler's gold that is made. The profits of the peddler jewelers it is almost impossible to calculate, for they will sell at any price upon which the smallest amount of profit can be realized. The foreign Jews, especially, will do this, and it is not an unusual circumstance for one of these men to ask fives. For an article which originally cost them 3d, and which they will eventually sell for 4d. In London there are about 200 hawkers of jewellery, who visit the public houses. But few of these have boxes, they invite customers by displaying some chains in their hands, or having one or two arranged in front of their waistcoats, while the smaller articles are carried in their waistcoat pockets. The class of persons who patronize the public house hawkers are those who visit the tap rooms of taverns, and countrymen in the vicinity of Smithfield upon market days, one of the hawkers tells me. That they succeed better upon the haymarket days than at the cattle sales, for the butchers, they say, are too, fly, for them. Sailors are among their best customers, but the coster girls are very fond of drop earrings and coral beads, the sailors, however, give the best prices of all. I am told that the quantity of old gold and silver which the country peddlers obtain in exchange for their goods is astonishing, and there have been occasions on which a peddler has been enriched for life by one single transaction of barter. Some old and unfashionable piece of jewellery, that they received for their goods, has been composed of costly stones, which had lain by for years, and of which the peddler's customer was unacquainted with the value. The more respectable jewellery peddlers put up at the better class of public houses, and, even after their day's travels are over, they still have an eye to business. They open the box upon the table of the taproom where they are lodging, and, under the pretense of cleaning or arranging their goods, temptingly display their glittering stock. The barmaid, kitchenmaid, the landlady's daughter, or perhaps the landlady herself, admires some ornaments, which the peddler declares would become them vastly. He hangs a necklace upon the neck of one of them. Holds a showy earring and drop to the ear of another, facetiously inquires of the girls whether they are not likely to want something of this sort shortly, as he holds up first a wedding ring, and then a baby's coral. Or else he exhibits a ring set with turquoise, or pearls and small diamonds in a cluster, to the landlady, and tries it on her finger, and by such arts a sale that will cover his expenses is generally effected. There is one peculiarity these men have when bartering their goods. A worn-out ornament of jewellery is brought to them, and, although it be brass, the peddler never attempts to undeceive the possessor, if he finds it is considered to be genuine. Of course he never gives cash for such articles, but he offers a large price in barter. I will take tens. For this ring, and allow you fives. For the old one, says the peddler. It would never do to say the ornament was not gold. The customer bought it years ago for such, and no one ever disputed its being the precious metal, should our peddler do so, he might as well shut up shop immediately. 
the lady would be angry and suspicious. Neither would she believe him, but rather suspect that he wanted only to cheat her, consequently the peddler barters, obtains the old ring, or some other article, and fives, for his commodity. And though the article he has taken in exchange is worth only a few pence, he very likely profits to the amount of 200% upon the cash received. The peddlers of lesser consequence put up at humble private or public houses, and some of them at the common lodging houses. Those who have only small stocks confine their visits to farmhouses and villages. Of the street sellers of card counters, medals, etc. The card counters, or, as I have heard them sometimes called by street sellers, the small coins, are now of a very limited sale. The slang name for these articles is jacks and half jacks. They are sold to the street people at only two places in London, one in Holborn, and the other at Black Tom's, himself formerly a street seller, now a small swag, in Clerkenwell. They are all made in Birmingham, and are of the size and color of the genuine sovereigns and half sovereigns, but it is hardly possible that anyone who had ever received a sovereign in payment could be deceived by the substitution of a jack. Those now sold in the streets are much thinner, and very much lighter. Each presents a profile of the Queen, but instead of the superscription Victoria de Gratia of the true sovereign, the jack has Victoria Regina. On the reverse, in the place of the Britanniarum Regina Fid. Death surrounding the royal arms and crown is a device intended for an imitation of a ste. George and the dragon, representing a soldier on horseback, the horse having three legs elevated from the ground, while a drawn sword fills the right hand of the equestrian, and a crown adorns his head. The superscription is, to Hanover, and the rider seems to be sociably accompanied by a dragon. Round the queen's head on the half-jack is, Victoria, Queen of Great Britain, and on the reverse the Prince of Wales's feather, with the legend, the Prince of Wales's model half-sovereign. Until within these five or six years the gilt card counters had generally the portraiture of the monarch, and on the reverse the legend, keep your temper, as a seasonable admonition to whist players. Occasionally the card counter was a gilt coin, closely resembling a sovereign, but the magistracy, eight or nine years back, put down the sale of these imitations. Under another head will be found an account of the use made of these sovereigns, in pretended wagers. A further use of them was to add to the heaps of apparent gold at the back of the tablekeeper in a race booth, when gambling was allowed at Epsom, and the great meetings. There are now only two men regularly selling jacks in the streets. There have been as many as twelve. One of these street sellers is often found in Holborn, announcing, 30s. 41D. 30s, 41D. Cheapest bargain ever offered, 30s. 41D. The jacks cost, wholesale, 4s. 6D, the gross, the half jacks 2s. 9D. The two are sold for 1D. If the sale be not brisk, the street seller will give a ring into the bargain. These rings cost ones. The gross, or the third part of a farthing each. If there be, on the year's average, only two street sellers disposing of the jacks, and earning nines. A week, to earn which the receipts will be about twenties. We find 104L. Expended in the streets on these trifles. Of metals the street sale is sometimes considerable, at others a mere nothing. When a popular subject is before the public, many of the general patterers go to medals. I could not learn that any of the present street people vended medals in the time of the war, I believe there are none at present among the street folk who did so. I am told that the street sale in war medals was smaller than might reasonably have been expected. The manufacture of those articles in the Salamanca, Vittoria, and even Waterloo days, was greatly inferior to what it is at present, and the street price demanded was as often 6d. As a smaller sum. These medals in a little time presented a dull, leaden look, and the knowledge that they were poor things seems to have prevented the public buying them to any extent in the streets, and perhaps deterred the street sellers from offering them. Those who were the most successful of the metal sellers had been, or assumed to have been, soldiers or seamen. 
Within the last 18 years, or more, there has hardly been any public occurrence without a comparatively well-executed medal being sold in the streets in commemoration of it. That sold at the opening of London Bridge was, I am told, considered, a superior thing, and the improvement in this art of manufacture has progressed to the present time. Within the last three years the most saleable medals, an experienced man told me, were of Hungerford Suspension, Bridge, the New Houses of Parliament, the Chinese Junk, and Sir Robert Peel. The Thames Tunnel medals were at one time very tidy, as were those of the new Royal Exchange. The great sale is at present of the Crystal Palace. And one man had heard that there were a great many persons coming to London to sell them at the opening of the Great Exhibition. The great eggs and bacon, I call it, he said, for I hope it will bring us that sort of grub. But I don't know. I'm afraid there'll be too many of us. Besides, they say we shan't be let sell in the park. The exhibition medal is as follows. What the street medal sellers call the right side, I speak of the penny medal, which commands by far the greatest sale, presents the crystal palace, raised from the surface of the metal and widened by the application of aqua fortis. The superscription is, The Building for the International Exhibition, London, 1851. On the wrong side, so called, is the following inscription, occupying the whole face of the metal. The construction is of iron and of glass. 1848 feet long. About half is 456 wide. The remainder 408 feet wide and 66 feet high. Site, upwards of 20 acres. Cost 150,000 pounds. Josh. Paxton, Arct.